All right, hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is February 17th, 2024, and as you can tell by the title, it's going to be another great one. You know, this the last one and this one, I think, are really great, not only attention getters for attention getting sake, but to be able to bring a greater understanding of the prophetic revelation that's been happening. It's it's been so incredible. And what I want to do tonight, like even at once the we get going into that portion is going to be what the title of tonight is, which I believe is something along the lines of uh, uh, confirming the covenant. You see, so much confusion is around this. Some people believe that it's Jesus that confirms the covenant, but they're not sure how it relates to prophecy in the end of days. And and others believe that 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 covenant being confirmed with many, that's it. The covenant with many is is a covenant related to the last seven years, which is what they believe tribulation is and where the Antichrist is going to make this covenant for seven years. It's I mean, those of you who have been around for a while, you get it. You understand, you know that that's not the case. But I thought it would be a great tie in to be able to show you know, with with a title that is fitting, that is appropriate, that will focus on what it is from Daniel 927 and how we can prove it out throughout Scripture. So that's going to be the, the bulk of tonight's focus. But before we get going, there's I wanted to share on this one just again a little bit, because one of the biggest issues is when I'm using a calendar like this. It's not really easy. I'm going back and forth and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and it's not really easy to follow. So I'm going to bring up a calendar for you guys, just a, a one year calendar that will show up on the screen and I'll just move my cursor to the places so everybody can get an idea. But I'm not going to go. I don't need to go into all the details. The reason I went into all the details is so that people can really understand that there are two wheat harvests and that it is vital to understand what their differences are. And for those who haven't seen it, this one is an awesome one. This one, the harvests of the earth, reveal the prophetic timings. This one is, it, it shows it all. It breaks it all down for you. So when we got the revelation, when it dawned on me in the shower with this, you say four months from John 4, I, I, was, I was blown away again, but yet at the same time, I was almost upset with myself to think, my goodness, why didn't I see that already? We know the difference between winter wheat and spring wheat. And so I'm going to touch on it just to help you guys see the clarity in it. I'm going to share something after that in relation to uh, events happening in the heavens that our brother Herman from uh, the UK shared in the Ministry Revealed Forum because the timing, you know, <laughs> the timing is not only kind of good, it's exactly good. And so its relation is to the heavens. And we'll touch on that. I'll show you a little video clip that somebody put together about it. And then we'll go into everything in relation to the one who makes the covenant. Because you have to remember, when a covenant is made, it can only be confirmed through the shedding of blood. And as much as I don't like to really go down that avenue too often, it's now part of the revelation we know what it means we've shown it we've revealed it we've understood it so even though that is part of it the focus is really about showing who is the one that confirms this covenant when he confirms this covenant and what entails when a covenant is made and then understanding why daniel 9 27 has it where it is in relation to the end of days <clears throat> so with that if you're new to the ministry, you will have just heard me talking about the forum. So if you wanted to join us in the forum, you can click right here from the YouTube channel, ministryrevealed.com. You can Google Ministry Revealed and go to the website. And from the website, there's, a, there's the menu. You can click on forum. It'll take you about five seconds to sign up, and it's free. About 1,200 people around the world and a number of people in the forum sharing on prayer requests on on events, on uh, our brother over in Uganda and his ministry and, and the support and all that it's reaching. 
um, all, all sorts of things, Bible studies, other people within the ministry that have started ministries now themselves and posting some of their videos, questions, concerns, comments, all sorts of things going on there. So like-minded brothers and sisters from all over the world, watching and praying and diligently seeking the Lord. So you can come and join us there. The other thing I always talk about is something that's always necessary. This is why I always do it. It's not just for repetition for everybody else. It's for anybody that's new who hasn't yet come to it. And that is to come to the playlist right here, or you can go to ministryrevealed.com. And when you go to the menu, click intro and watch the first four intro videos of the whole series that's there. If you're on YouTube, you click playlist. And when you do, you come to this one right here. It's called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. The first four videos, the very first video is about 22 minutes and it introduces what you're going to come to understand in the next three. So the second one is the 30 minutes and it's, it's a 30 minute introduction Bible study to the differences within the Gospels. These mysteries that people have, have tried to, you know, just try to talk around, you know, things that, you know, in the Gospels of like Luke, Mark and Matthew, you see Jesus going to the cross and he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe in Luke. He was arrayed in purple in Mark and he was arrayed in scarlet in Matthew. It's not because they were colorblind and they just chose whatever colors. It is all, as you will understand, prophetic. You hear in Jesus when he's on the cross, his final words in Luke are into your arms. I commend my spirit. Yet in Mark and in Matthew, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the word in Greek into English means leave behind. So Mark and Matthew's group, you see, there's a prophetic understanding being revealed within it. That's telling you that Mark and Matthew's portions are being left behind while Luke's group is going into the arms of the father. Well, what does this mean? It's the same thing with the with the color of the robes. You know, what is a gorgeous, white, radiant, bright robe mean? Well, it's a bride robe. What are the colors of purple and scarlet? Well, they're tribulation colors like the woman who rides the beast. The two that are left behind, colors of tribulation, the one that goes into the father's arms, arrayed in white, not a tribulation color. So these are the types of things. Those are the, the low-hanging fruit that are awesome to understand. And that's what you'll begin to understand in the second video, which is the beginning of understanding these differences in the Gospels that are actually prophecy. And we have shown dozens and dozens and dozens, maybe even a hundred or plus different uh, differences within the Gospels. And they always tell us the same story of the three different groups. When you realize this, you'll see that the tribulation isn't seven years. And that's the third video, which is the second 30 minute intro video called the 14 years. And you will see that Luke's group, group, group being pre-trib and then a period of time called above. And then it's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. It's absolutely true. When you realize the differences in the Gospels and who they're speaking to, you'll realize the differences within the discourses and what they reveal in tribulation. And you'll understand why one was purple, one goes into the arms of the Father. Why one is, or sorry, why one is white and goes into the arms of the Father. Why one is purple and one is scarlet. You understand that there are different timings of the coming of the Lord. And when you do, you will realize pre, mid, and post are all true. That's why everybody can go to Scripture and stand on their own points of Scripture to debate back and forth if they believe in pre or somebody else believes in mid and somebody else believes in post. It's because they're all true. So how do you how do you reconcile them all being true? You understand the differences in the Gospels. And then you get to the fourth video. And the fourth video in this playlist is a big one. It's about two hours and 45 minutes. But I promise you, every one of these four videos are going to be all worth every moment of your time. Because that fourth one lays it all out for you. How then has all of this not been known before? How did we miss it? Number one, it wasn't yet the Lord's timing. Number two, and this is what it reveals, 
is it's all because of Matthew. We have all been taught generation after generation for hundreds and hundreds of years from the Gospel of Matthew. And we've looked to Mark as a little bit of filler, and we look to Luke as a little bit of filler, and everybody's foundation has come from Matthew. That's the problem. Because Mark and Luke in the Synoptic Gospels have never been understood in relation to the different groups and who they're speaking to, it was never understood. And so people look through the eyes of Matthew, which is seven years of trumpets, not seven years of total tribulation, and they've missed the first seven coming for the world or the church that's asleep and isn't ready. Their, theirs will be the great multitude rapture, which is mid-trib in the seventh year of seals. Luke's is pre-trib and Matthew's is post-trib. You will see these things, you will begin to understand them, and then you can continue on through the videos that come after them and dig into it a, a lot more. I promise you, you will see scripture in a light that will open up your understanding to, to questions that we have probably, all of you have had as we have had in the past. What ir, why is this happening? Why are there all these differences? Why does there appear to be so much confusion? This is the beginning of your revelation. And like I said, it will be worth all of your time, I promise you. So with that, take your time, go in and check it out, and we'll see you when you come back to this video. <laughs> but you're free to follow along in this video, of course. But if you're new, you will definitely be left with some questions. So that's where you want to go. All right. So now let's get started. Let me touch on some of the, the main points to, to bring clarity for those who were still wondering in relation to what this four months was all about. So here's a calendar. And it was interesting, you know, I, I had a, um, a good Zoom call the other day with our brother Ivan in South Africa. And we went through some things and, and he helped with a portion of, of the is, you know, when, when we look at the events that did take place, for example, in Daniel 9, and you see everybody talking about Daniel 9, 27, and they say, oh, it's a gap. It, it stopped, and there's a gap now for the next seven years where everything's on hold for 2,000 years. Well, that's utterly preposterous. Right. The, the, the Lord didn't suddenly say, oh, OK, wait, there, there's one more set of seven. I'm going to hold off here. No, Ivan has a great, great video series that he did. I don't know how many videos, but there was main one. And I think there was more than one where he uses some incredible research. I think it was the late 1800s or early 1900s. And a guy went extensively through the the lineages and added all of their lifespans and their years and when this war and that war and when these things took out in scripture and guess where it lined up it is perfectly in line with what we have here in ministry revealed in our where is it in this seven year sabbath timeline that goes from the birth of christ that shows that this truly is the final jubilee so if this is the jubilee in 2038 to 2039 from fall to fall then it really appears that undoubtedly 2024 is going to be the year that it all begins you see and it all went back to the words jesus spoke in 28 29 a.d when he spoke the words in Luke chapter 4 that described he was proclaiming the Jubilee. And in that proclamation of the Jubilee, you go read any theologian, they, they all understand that Jesus was proclaiming the Jubilee. Well, when we understand what year that was, all we had to do was take it forward. Maybe you're off by one year too early, one year too late, you see? But what happens is right in this time frame, and when you understand that Luke chapter 3 Tiberius Caesar, the year that that was in a Gregorian year, everything falls in line. Lo and behold, Ivan's doing all this work in the back end on another study he had been doing for a long time, and the count equaled the same thing. But now why am I bringing this up? 
the reason is because is because um when when Ivan went into all of this in relation to Daniel chapter 9 what a lot of people say virtually everybody especially seven year tribbers is that oh Daniel 9:27 is is the one year is the is the one year as seven years and it's been fulfilled already by Christ in the events that took place. I mean, sorry, it, it wasn't yet fulfilled. That, that it was fulfilled, these things here with Christ, and that this is the final seventh year of seals. Well, when you want, uh, sorry, of seals and trumpets, of tribulation. When you understand it, in the is of events that took place, it's 70 times seven, right? And it's the nine, 490, and you break it all down, there was no gap of one more week of seven years. What did Jesus fulfill? Watch this. What did Jesus fulfill in the is, not prophetically, but in the is of what Jesus fulfilled in the midst of the seventh year? Look at this. There's your seventh year from Christ, right? Your new, Jub your new not only Jubilee cycle, but your new seven-year Shemitah, that one year like Daniel 9 27 and what did it say in the midst of it in the midst of the week he put an end of sacrifice you see right in the midst of the week hello it was pretty wild so Ivan had shared that and I thought it was fantastic I, I've shared with you guys in the past when it comes to things in the is my eyes are so focused and so understanding in, in the is to come that when I try to understand the the was or the is that took place, it's always been a little twisted because there's things that don't seem to make sense. And so Ivan helped bring clarity to that, that there is no gap of seven years. Of course, the years continue to be counted. And in the midst of that last seven, Jesus fulfilled it. But we know what it means prophetically now when we look in the eyes of the is to come. These weeks are weeks as single years. That it is 70 years are determined upon Israel. That the first seven weeks relate to the first seven years of seals. Then you have three score or 60 and two weeks. Two weeks is two years. The three score is actual weeks, which would be 60, which would be another year and two months. It's about three and a half years when you add in the additional 30 days and you add in the additional 45 days. There, there's a whole revelation that shows that this is approximately three and a half years. So this is your seven weeks as seven years of seals. This is your first about three and a half weeks or three and a half years of, of of trumpets, the first half, until Messiah is cut off, a war that breaks out for two and a half years. We're going to touch on this tonight. All of this lasts about two and a half years. We know it from Daniel 9. And then this is the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, confirming his covenant that he made when he came in the seventh year of seals. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Why does he then have to confirm it here? Well, because he had to break his covenant. Because Satan was cast down, the pit was opened, a war breaks out for two and a half years, and something happens because the covenant must be confirmed. Right? There, there, has, to be, there, there has to be a covenant that takes place, right? There has to be something that happens. And then this is when he confirms it and completes that final year. And, of course, he destroys all the enemies and the millennial reign begins. But we'll get into it. I just wanted to touch on it here because Ivan helped shed some light that there was no gap of seven years and saying, well, that's going to be held off for the next 2,000 years. Of course, the count continued. And when you understand the count properly and very so good as Ivan does from his deep studies, you realize that this was the actual year of seven years for which in the midst of that following set of seven, Jesus did confirm his covenant. And so we're going to talk about it, though, in the prophetic 
what this means and where this final confirming is, which isn't about his death, but about when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. It, he's going to confirm the covenant with what? With many. Who's the only one that makes the covenant? Jesus. Who can break the covenant? Jesus. Who's going to confirm the covenant that he made with many, which is the nations? Jesus. Okay. So this is what you're, this is what we're going to get into. So, but we're, we'll get into that in a moment. Okay. We'll really get into that in a moment. This is what we were talking about here in the last video in relation to John chapter four. In John chapter four, this piece that people have wanted to know for so long, including us, now revealed in John 4, 35, say you not there are yet four months, then comes harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look for the field, look on the fields, for they are white, which is the word meaning Luke, which is fitting, because that's where the white robe is found. Uh, for they are white already to harvest. So he's saying, you guys are looking for a harvest that is ready to be harvested. It's not the end of the harvest. It's the beginning of the harvest. It's ready to be harvested. But you're looking for one in four months from now when it's ready to be harvested. I'm telling you, look here. There's one four months early that is ready to be harvested. Now, let me show you this in a calendar. Here's 2024, okay? In this year, 2024, in Nissan, okay, we know that this is the time in middish April when the barley and the sheaf of the barley and then the harvest of the barley is about to begin, okay? So we have barley here in about middish April starting to get harvested. We know that winter wheat, which is planted in the fall at the same time as barley, barley grows faster and is harvested first. And then when barley comes to an end in, again, I want you all to remember this year in 2024 is a later year because there's a second Adar. So it's expected that the harvest would be, would, would be ready to harvest a little bit later than usual, but it fits for every single harvest. It doesn't change. So it's usually anywhere that winter wheat, as barley comes to an end, winter wheat is ready in late May into midish or so June. And this year, as barley comes to an end, it's now going to be the time of winter wheat harvest. So winter wheat is late May to midish June, which means from about mid-May, uh, April where it was, to about mid-June. How many months do you have? One, two months. So Jesus clearly, at least to start with here, Jesus couldn't have been at around the barley harvest and been saying, hey, winter wheat, you guys are looking for winter wheat that's, that's ready in the summer to start harvesting. I'm telling you, look, four months early. No, doesn't work. Because barley starts harvesting only two months before winter wheat. So that doesn't work. Well, what if we were at the beginning of barley and Jesus is saying, while the barley here is ready to harvest, hey, you guys are looking for spring wheat, which is ready late September, but this year is October. You're looking for, for spring wheat and it's four months. Oh, no, it isn't. It's six months. This is the beginning of barley. One, two, three, four, five, six. He couldn't have been saying that. So you're eliminating a count that begins with, with a harvest of, of a grain, which can't be to spring wheat, uh, winter wheat in this time frame. It can't be to spring wheat, which is in this time frame, nor can it be to the grapes. Because as we know, the grapes are also ready at the same time as the spring wheat harvest. 
So that means this has only got a two-month count. This one's got a six-month count. So clearly Jesus couldn't have been speaking from a time when the barley was ready to be harvested. Okay? So we got that out of the way. He certainly couldn't have been saying from October and saying, oh, the, the spring wheat is ready to be harvested. Okay? He, was he saying this in John? It's you guys, this one is ready. But you guys think what? Four months? One, two, three, four, five, six before barley. Eight before winter wheat. So he clearly couldn't have been in the fall. He couldn't have been in the spring. He couldn't have been in the fall. Because if he was saying it in relation to spring wheat, which is ready to be harvested in the fall at the same time as the grape harvest, he couldn't have been saying it there. Because the next harvest to be ready isn't for another six months. So you've got one that's two months. You've got one that's six months. You've got one down here. Even grapes, that's another six months one. You can't be at the one for the spring wheat harvested in the fall because you have another six months before this one. And he told them that you guys think that there's a harvest that begins in four months. Obviously, because there is. But he then says, but I tell you, look around, lift up your eyes and look that this one is ready to be harvested now four months before the one you're looking at. We've just eliminated any barley count to any other harvest. We've just eliminated any spring wheat or grape harvest that happens in the fall to any other harvest. What's left? The only one that's left is winter wheat. You see, barley and winter wheat are planted late fall. They take root and grow throughout winter, and then barley starts to prop up really quick and is ready to be harvested in the spring. It starts getting harvested here while wheat is coming up behind it, okay, coming up quickly behind it. Barley starts to be harvested here to April, into May, even into the early part of June, maybe late May to early June. And when it comes to an end, now it's time for winter wheat to be harvested. Winter wheat starts its harvest, and then winter wheat comes to an end, and then there's a little break, and then it's time for grapes and spring wheat, because the spring wheat was planted usually around Passover, around a little bit after Passover, and it takes root and then grows and is harvested in late summer to early fall. So guess what? If there is no count of four months that you can do from when barley is ripe and ready to harvest and there is no four-month count, barley couldn't have been what Jesus was saying was four months early. If we go to grapes or spring wheat and Jesus says, hey, this is ready four months before yours and there's nothing for at least six months, Jesus couldn't have been in the spring wheat. So what if we go to winter wheat? And winter wheat that is ready late May to middish June. In this year, because it's later, it's around the 21st, 22nd of June is the time frame. Now we're talking about literal harvests on the earth. These are the actual time frames of them. It doesn't mean it's it's always gonna be here. It's like grapes. They say grapes, you know, the the the, the core time of grapes is mid-February to mid, uh, mid-September to mid-October. But in different parts of the world, people can be doing it here, people can be doing it there. There can be controlled environments and all sorts of things. But the general overall understanding, even in today's day, these are the harvest time that I've been telling you about. And so when we come to winter wheat, which is planted here, and this year the harvest would begin around mid-ish June, I believe prophetically scripturally in the typology of the Leia type gentile bride the old going before the new that it begins the count on june 21st 22nd okay and your seven weeks begin so if jesus was right here 
and he was overlooking the fields of winter wheat that was ready and he says hey you guys say one two three four months is when the harvest comes but i tell you one two three four months before there's one already ready to begin to harvest what do you think this is winter wheat this is spring wheat it is the only two harvest brothers and sisters they are the only two that have four months between them and you cannot even say spring wheat which is harvested late summer early fall you can't even say this is the one he was at because there is no four months later the next one closest where it's ready to harvest is six months which means jesus was in the winter wheat fields or by it and was saying lift up your heads and look at this winter wheat that is ready one two three four months before the spring wheat harvest that you're always looking for now can you see what i'm saying on the calendar it's the only one that is four months that's what jesus was talking about that you say right say you not there are yet four months then that comes the harvest behold i say unto you lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest it is the leah winter wheat picture that comes before the rachel spring wheat now to help somebody else clarify others that have had questions it doesn't mean you see these harvests happen every single year but in the prophetic in who they represent we're talking about pre mid and post okay they're not happening back to back every single year <coughs> and so this year if 2024 is the year then this begins the count of the seven weeks to the true feast of weeks when the pre-trib would happen on august 12th okay depending what part of the world 11th 12th and we know that the harvest this is the beginning of the harvest but the feast of first fruits doesn't get brought in until the harvest is done and this was something as it was going through this discussion with ivan he brought up a piece of scripture that i had totally forgotten about and i'm so grateful that he brought it up because it was right there he's like well go bring up numbers 28 and so we went to numbers 28 because because part of the discussion was well if this is the time of the beginning of the harvest doesn't the first fruits of the winter wheat lay a pre-trib wouldn't it happen at the beginning because it's the first fruits and i was explaining no it happens at the end that's why it's baked with leaven and brought in right so if it happens at the end well where can we prove it and he helped me out with that he reminded me of this piece of scripture this is again the feasts of the lord this comes from numbers 28 verse 26 also in the day of the first fruits let me go to esord so that you guys can see it for yourselves and see the numbers that we're talking about listen to this also in the day of the first fruits look at that 1061 remember 1061 is the feast of first fruits right the 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 hebrew 7225 is the feast of first fruits not the feast of weeks of the first fruits but the feast of first fruits and that's of course jesus this one is the pre trib leia group so listen to what it says also in the day of the first fruits when you bring a new offering unto the lord after your weeks be out is when you have that holy convocation right there bang there's the answer to it right there which means this year the 21st to 22nd or i think it's 22nd then you do your seven sabbaths right your seven weeks count it brings you to august 12th so if we go to the calendar 
we know this is the the picture of when the count begins so you've got one two three four five Oops, where was I? I think I did that last time too. <laughs> uh, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, six, seven. Okay, so there's your seventh week. There's your end of your seven weeks. It brings you to the August 12th, 8th of Av. Okay, so there's your beginning of your count. There's the end of your count. There was the beginning of your harvest, which is four months before the ones that the Jews look to because the Jews are always looking for Rachel, right? That's what I was saying. They, they don't like Leah, right? You go to any Jew and every Jew will tell you it's Rachel. It's all about Rachel. And it's very fitting because even scripture, we showed that in you know, with the story with Jacob, he didn't want Leah. He wanted Rachel. We saw with Samson that he, he, he hated the older. He didn't want the older. So the father-in-law gave him the younger. It's the same story played over and over again. It doesn't mean that the Lord doesn't love us and the Lord doesn't want his pre-trib group. Of course he does. It's a prophetic picture for us to understand. And this is the one ready four months early. So we could see that the apostles being Jews, even they didn't know back then to be looking for the winter wheat harvest because they were focusing on the Rachel, not the Leah. Funny how that worked, right? And so he's telling them, look, no, four months early is the harvest that's ready. So it doesn't mean that in October of this year that the Rachel harvest is going to take place. Rachel is the one that relates to the mid-trib great multitude rapture. And that will happen in the seventh year of seals. So at the end of six years of seals, it's the time of the rapture and the group coming in, but the, the, the actual rapture itself doesn't happen until Passover in the midst of that seventh year. Okay? So that they, they can be brought in, like they're being, they're being gathered in, but it doesn't happen for another about six to seven months. So when we see this, we even understand it here in De Deuteronomy, as we spoke about before, when it says seven weeks shall thou number from when you put the sickle to the corn. This is the Feast of Weeks one. That's the Leah. That's the one this year in June when the harvest is ready to begin. And you don't bring, you don't have the first fruits till the end of those seven weeks. And then you have the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. And it's what? After you've gathered in what? the corn and wine so when is the corn and wine and ready right here four months later once it's brought in there you go then you have your events of your feast of tabernacles so in the when six years are over of seals and it's time to bring in the grapes and the and the and the spring wheat which is represented by rachel it starts to get brought in here. It is gathered in here. But it cannot be observed until the following year, or I should say, you know, our following Gregorian year, but later in that seventh year till the second day of Passover. Now, I've submitted before, it may not be first Passover, but they may actually come in in the seventh year of second Passover. And there's a reason for that. We'll touch on it on some other things uh, as we go a little bit further. And it relates to what happens at the end of the six years of seals. The, this timing that we're leading into tonight that will go into when the Lord is the one who makes this covenant. You know, so many people have missed. At no point did Satan or Antichrist or any beast build the temple. Okay. It was always in the will of the Lord. There, there was no covenant confirmed by these guys except by the Lord. Yet everybody thinks that it relates to the Antichrist and the beast who's going to make this covenant and rebuild the temple and then go into it and declare himself to be God. No, that's not what's going to happen. Okay? So this is what we're talking about. This is the four months. He was talking clearly, unequivocally. It's not even, I mean, I just showed you. If there's barley, wheat, wheat, and wine, there is no other option 
for what harvest Jesus could have been talking about, saying, lift up your heads and look that this one is ready to harvest already, four months before the one you're looking for. It was another confirmation to show that we have we are on track. We have understood the difference between winter wheat and spring wheat that Leah goes first and Rachel goes later. So now <clears throat> let's take this to another step. You see, that means we're looking for whoops, we're looking for the pre trib. If twenty twenty four is the year, which I believe it is, we're looking for it to happen sometime, give or take on where you are in the world, around the twelfth of August in twenty twenty four. And we have so many other videos of other biblical evidences that have brought all of this revelation together. This isn't only about what we're talking tonight. There are a dozen other things, at least, if not two dozen, that have led us to this. And if it isn't 2024, I do believe it is. I believe the scriptures have revealed it as well. But if it's not, whatever year it's going to be, I believe scriptures revealed that it will be on the 8th of Av, of whatever year it's going to happen, at true Feast of Weeks, okay? So now, when true Feast of Weeks happens, and the pre-trib group is taken out, we know that then there's then going to be a wedding for seven days in heaven, Leah's wedding, which, if you guys remember the last video, it was just a great little, a great little side note that the word weeks for for Leah's week, right, where he had to fulfill her week, her wedding week, right, is the same word for the Feast of Weeks. And we showed the places where it's used like 19 times. Fulfill her week is the Feast of Weeks. How fitting. How fitting that her wedding begins at the time of what? When the seven Sabbaths are over? And then there's the fulfilling of her week from the Feast of Weeks. And then what do we know? We're not going to go into all the seal stuff. I just want to show you something else that was shared by our brother Herman. It's something we've spoken about that we know happens during the first seven days. Of which we know the pre-trib leaves. And then we know there's a seven-day Leah wedding that's taking place in heaven. We know there's a group of remnant workers that are waiting for when the Lord will return from the wedding and knock. So he's not coming on the 7th. He's coming sometime on the 8th day after the wedding. And we also know that during this time, there's going to be an attack in northern Israel, according to Isaiah, according to Zechariah. We know, and especially according to Isaiah chapter 9. We know that two northern cities in Israel, Haifa and Tel Aviv, are going to be attacked. They're going to be destroyed. And in this, it's going to begin on the 9th of Av. So on day one, pre-trib happens. The Lord anoints the apostles. The seven-day wedding is now taking place. And at the beginning of the seven-day wedding that's taking place in heaven, right after the pre-trib, northern Israel, Haifa and Tel Aviv are attacked and destroyed. And... During that week, it is a short-lived Middle East war that breaks out. It will only last, I believe, Scripture reveals it, and I believe from videos we've seen that this plan that they've been trying to make happen with Iran and Israel, which it's going to be Iran that destroys Haifa and Tel Aviv, and that's what causes this short war, but that it would only last a week. Okay? Because they know what this can all lead to. And what else do we know? What else is happening in this week, brothers and sisters? There's something we've spoken about many times over the years. Let me show you. In Luke chapter 22, we haven't discussed it in a little while, but when this little video was shared with me, I thought, what a great time to bring it up again. Watch this. We know in Luke chapter 22, verse 41, and it says, this is when Jesus went to pray, okay, on the Mount of Olives, just before he was taken into the hands of sinful men, it says, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast or a stone's throw. Do you realize this term is only used once? And in every other story, when Jesus goes to pray, it's never mentioned. 
So when you understand the differences in the Gospels, when you understand that there's a reason something is said in Luke, not in Mark, not in Matthew, or in Matthew, not in Mark, not in Luke in the Synoptic Gospels, or the story in Luke, Mark, and Matthew is there, but it's quite different in all three. It is all because of prophecy. And this one is no different. Being a stone's cast or a stone's throw away is only found in Luke chapter 22. So this is Jesus saying he's only a stone's throw away. Pretty interesting because when we've connected this and we go to John chapter 8, we see this picture of this typology of, the, of a Gentile woman, right? A woman taken in adultery. It's a picture of his Gentile bride. That's what it, that's the adultery. Even Ruth, remember, you go into Ruth's name and she says she's a stranger. And she's this word stranger means adulterer because it's a typology. It's it's a wording for Gentile. And what is what does it say? They turn to him and say, hey, Moses in the law said that she should that those like this should be stoned. Jesus writes down and this bends over, writes in the sand. And then in John eight, verse seven. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone. Who's the only one who can cast a stone? Him who is without sin. So only Jesus can cast the first stone or can cast a stone. And what was the, the word in Luke? He said he was a stone's throw away. Here's the word for throw. There's the word for throw. The same word, 906. 906, the root word of this one. So he's saying he's the only one that could throw a stone. And then he stooped down and they all started walking away one by one. And Jesus is left alone standing in the midst. And there was none left but the woman. Right? Almost like I say, like it's a proposal type of thing going on. Okay? So he's saying only he can cast a stone because he's the one without sin. In Luke 22, the only place in the discord in the in the Gospels where it talks about it, it's only in Luke. And what do we know this is connected to? You're going to see tonight that a lot of tonight is also going to be connected to this chart that we have called chapters to years. If you're new, it's because these books here have all opened up to us in relation to their chapters and the prophetic words that they speak built into them that reveal the events in their years in order in the end of days. It's absolutely mind-blowing when you come to understand it. There's a reason why Hosea and Zechariah each have 14 chapters when you understand the truth is 14 years. Okay? It's, it's absolutely incredible. And we're going to see some of these things in... In a little bit in John towards the end, we're going to see a little bit in Zechariah. We're going to see some a little bit in Ezekiel. We're going to see some in Psalms. We're going to see some in Hebrews. And it's not because my plan was to make it about a chapters to years to show these events during these years. It just so happens that all of the little tidbits are hidden within all of these chapters in the year time frames where these discussions are going to be taking place. And for anybody that's new, just so you're aware, this doesn't mean seal one, year one, seal two, year two. That's not how it works. It just means that the seals will play out. The first seal happens in this 50 days. And the next six seals happen over the next seven years. Okay, that's what it means. It doesn't mean one year one, one year two. That's not what it means. Some will start, some will stop, some will intermix, some will... We'll go over the others and continue, okay? It's not a one-by-one-by-one, one by one, just so you're aware. So, when, when we see this now, what else do we know this stone's throw is connected to? Well, again, when you go to the discourses. When we go to the discourses, as I said in the opening, if you're new, and you realize what these differences in the Gospels are revealing, and how Luke is pre and then a portion above, and then seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets for Mark and Matthew, you realize why the discourses are different. And look at what Luke's discourse says. 
It says, at the coming of the Son of Man. Listen to what it says, verse 25, in Luke 21. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, and men's hearts failing them, for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on, which means an impending attack arriving upon the earth, uh, upon uh, coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And I've often wondered, and I still get, you know, is, is Luke chapter 21 here in relation to the coming of the Lord, is this coming to him coming to take out the pre-trib? Or is this really telling us about Jesus coming back on the eighth day. Okay? Because it's saying that there's going to be distress of nations, right? With perplexity, men's hearts failing them, looking after these things that are coming on the earth. So the question is, these things that are going to be seen coming, which I believe are directly related to the stone's throw, are either telling us that the stone's throw is coming right at the beginning, right? Right at the beginning, and that's him coming in a cloud. That's the pre-trib group going. And the world seeing these things coming, which would then have to equal August 12th, seeing these things coming, are going to be in a panic, freaking out, seeing these things coming on the earth. But you see, when we go to Luke 21, this is why I always bring it back to we might see it, but we'll not the pre-trib won't be here for it. Because why? In Luke 21, 36, it says, Watch ye therefore, uh, watch ye therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. Which means if you're to escape all these things coming to pass that Luke 21 is talking about, it means you won't be here for this. Which means this is then most likely the son of man coming to take out the pre-trib group at the timing of the 12th of august and then the world seeing these things coming are in a panic because these things are coming upon the earth and it's the stone's throw so not only is it a picture of the pre-trib and the and the lord coming in a cloud to take them before they hit the earth but then we see that we know they're going to hit the earth after the pre-trib is taken out because they've escaped all these things. And after they're taken out and the Son of Man was seen in a cloud by them and they're gone, what do we know happens? Well, then they're going to hit on the earth. Because all of those men's hearts who are failing them, those who are left behind, men's hearts failing them for fear of looking after those things that are coming on the earth, that means they're going to start hitting the earth. So not only is it a seven-day wedding in heaven, but on the earth, northern Israel is attacked, Haifa and Tel Aviv destroyed. And in all of this, there's a short war that's taking place in Israel with Arab nations. And men's hearts are failing them because they're seeing what's coming on the earth. It would appear maybe we see it, but then the bride is taken out by him on a cloud. And then they start falling on the earth during this time. Because then what does Jesus say? Jesus says that he's a stone's throw away. So you see how it can be interpreted. It, it's either he's saying he's a stone's throw away. So we're going to see the stone's throw. And bang, he's on his way. But it could also be the stone's throw. Here they are. They're coming upon the earth. And then what? After it's hit and after it's come, he shows up on the eighth day after the wedding, which is when he begins his 40 days. You see how that can be made to, to understand? It, it seems like it actually is a little bit of both. There's the pre-group going out, and we know when he returns after the wedding, and he comes to this group, which is the portion of the bride that was chosen to remain. It could be that now he's coming to them in reading Luke 21 there as well. So you can kind of see it for both. 
But what is it telling us? It's telling us that this is the time right here. <clears throat> if this is the time of the pre-trib, which we've been revealing now for over a year or about a year, what is this also telling us? Well, according to Luke, this is the time when the stone's throw would be seen. This would be the peak time when it's seen and then men's hearts are starting to fail them because whatever it is is either hitting on the earth in this time or it's on its way. And then we'll start hitting the earth. But it all relates to it being seen, a group gone, then the world seeing it as well and panicking and it falling sometime in here. But the Lord saying he's a stone's throw away. And then here he comes to begin his 40 days, having been a stone's throw away. OK, now, why do I share this? Why does it matter? Well, there's a reason why our brother Herman shared it in the forum. Have a listen. Space enthusiasts, mark your calendars for August 12th, 2024, because we're in for a celestial spectacle like no other. Get ready for a meteor shower that's going to light up the night sky, with stars breaking at an incredible rate of 60 every hour. Yes, you heard that right. A star breaking every single minute. This breathtaking event is thanks to the Swift-Tuttle Comet, and it's a phenomenon that occurs every year between July 17th and August 24th. But this year, the shower will reach its peak from August 12th to 13th, offering an unparalleled view of our universe in action. So, if you're as fascinated by space and science... Pretty wild, right? So between that portion of July 17th to August 21st, uh, or 24th, whatever it was, the peak period of this meteor shower in 2024 is August 12th to the 13th. Funny how that happens, right? I didn't know that till it was shared in the forum. <clears throat> I find that pretty darn fascinating and that it's coming from the comet Tuttle, I think it's called. And this is the peak time. Well, if it's the prophetic end of days beginning, how perfect would that timing be to exactly what Luke 21 says? Is it possible that at some point in some year on the date that it's supposed to happen, it lands right on the date of this meteor shower and some get through and men's hearts failing them for fear of looking after those things that are coming upon the earth? It's the same date this year. Here's from uh, space.com. It talks about it as well. Okay. The Presides meteor shower, when, where, how to see it. The next Presides uh, meteor shower will peak around the night of August 12th to the dawn of the 13th, again, depending what part of the world you're in. Is this the year they break through and what ends up happening for men's hearts failing them for fear of looking after those things coming upon the earth. I thought it was worth sharing. I thought the connection and the timing was fantastic. And so I wanted to share that with you guys as well. <laughs> so with that, let's now continue on and get into this part in relation to the covenant. Let's show that indeed it is Jesus who confirms this covenant in Daniel chapter 9. I know many of you guys have seen it in the big picture before. You've understood it as, as we've revealed these things throughout the 14 years. But I don't know that I've ever done a video just specifically showing where Christ and the time frame of when Christ would be the one making this covenant. And not only making the covenant, but the reason for why he needs to confirm the covenant. You see, this is a confirming of a covenant, okay? To prevail, to strengthen this covenant that he had made. And even though we know in what I was saying in the beginning and what Ivan revealed in relation to how this played out in the is of the events of when Christ came the first time, we have revealed and have understood now for years in this ministry what it means and how it lays out in relation to the is to come. Okay, so let's go into that and let's show 
what this final Daniel 9.27 is about. Because this Daniel 9.27 isn't about the seven years of tribulation. Absolutely, unequivocally is not when it comes to prophecy. It is literally about the final 14th year of tribulation. It's all about the final year. Okay? We've shown this many, many, many times in relation to how the picture plays out. The seven years of seals where we know Israel, after the first attack that happens, like we were just showing in Haifa and Tel Aviv, it's a short war. Then the Son of Man is here for 40 days. He leaves. And then there's three more days to what we call Acts 2.0. And at the day and hour, no one knows at the Feast of Trumpets 2024, the 14 years begins at the Red Horse Rider. When that begins, there's going to be Jerusalem. At that point, Jerusalem itself will be attacked and destroyed, like Jeremiah foretells us. They will then flee to the mountains. They will flee to the wilderness. And they're removed for seven weeks as seven years. Okay, that's what it's telling us. Seven weeks as years is the prophetic is to come. That's why you don't see, there's no discussion about what happens during those seven years because they're now removed. The real discussion is then the comma and, which means seven years, comma and, meaning in addition to a separate thing and added to it. And this is the about three and a half years as we mentioned earlier, which means. This is the first three, the first half approximately of trumpets. And in the first half of trumpets, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And we know the temple will be as well. This is the part where, where the church, where the world of prophecy in the church thinks that it's only going to be seven years. And they say, see, these are the seven weeks of years. And they break this down to say it means this seven. Why do they do this? Again, I always reference back to the it's all because of Matthew video, because all of their foundational understanding comes from the gospel of Matthew, hence Matthew's discourse. So they all believe that the temple is going to be built first. You see, and so that's why you'll have some pre-trib people say that, oh, they're going to declare the rebuilding of the temple. And then we go and you got pre-tribbers that say, no, the temple's going to be built. And then the one who built it, who's the Antichrist, is going to go into it and declare himself to be God. And then we go mid-trip. You see? You see the confusion? In none of those cases, is it pre or is it mid or is it even post? Not one of them. Not one is connected to pre, mid, or post. The pre is going to happen seven years before seven years and 50 days before the rebuilding of the city streets and wall takes place and it's messiah who is going to be here as the high priest and king messiah the prince okay it's messiah they're actually going to be building it because the lord will be here he is the one coming at the end of seals on heavenly Mount Zion, which we're going to show. And he is the one who makes a covenant at that point. In some, at some point in that seventh year of seals, that is when he makes the covenant. And for a covenant to be made, there has to be the shedding of blood. Okay. So this is what we're going to break down. This is what I'm going to show you that, in fact, it's when Messiah himself is here. That he is the one that makes the covenant. He is the one here during the first three and a half years of trumpets. Well, he was even there at the final year of seals. And then makes this covenant. And then in the first half of trumpets, he's here while the city and streets and temple are being rebuilt. Until he gets cut off. And this cutoff is at the end of this about three and a half years when Satan is cast down. The pit is opened. And then what happens? It tells us, then the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and 
the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war, which means there was a war that started and a war that ended, desolations are determined. So this is all of this right here, right to the end, starting from right here, three score and two weeks. This is all about the final seven years of trumpets. These are the first about three and a half years of trumpets till he's cut off. Then going after with the flood and unto the end of the war is two and a half years, which we'll show again, but we've talked about it. It's Daniel um, uh, 12, verse 7. And then that leaves one final week, one final year, which is the seventh year of trumpets. You see, this is why when everybody looks through the eyes of Matthew, they believe there's a proclamation, the temple's going to get rebuilt, and it is going to get rebuilt, and that starts the seven years. But it's because they completely missed that there's a first seven years that comes first. When they see through the eyes of Matthew only, they're expecting the temple will get built in the first three and a half years of tribulation. Well, they're right. From a Matthew perspective, unfortunately, they've missed Mark's understanding and more importantly they've missed luke's understanding okay so let's break this down let's go into this and show you what i'm talking about let's go to romans 11 in romans 11 is where this will really get going and it's all this relation to the word of covenant uh let's start in verse 25, Romans 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this, min, uh, of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Means they're going to be blinded until the end of the time of the Gentiles, till their fullness comes in. So the understanding of that is when. And then it goes on, verse 26. And so shall all Israel be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer. Out of Zion comes a deliverer, and he shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the Gospels, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. You see, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer. Okay? When is Jesus going to be on Zion, on Mount Zion? When is he going to be on Mount Zion? Do you understand? This is the answer <clears throat> to his covenant. That he's going to still have to, this other one that he's still making. Blindness has been given to them until the fullness of us, the Gentiles, comes in. Is the fullness of the Gentiles come in yet? No. Nope. When the Son of Man comes pre-trib for the pre-trib and everything's about to start, is he coming on Mount Zion? Nope. Which means he's not turning away ungodliness from Jacob during the seven years of seals because he's not yet coming on Mount Zion. Which means for this is the covenant for this is my covenant, which means he hasn't yet put out this covenant unto them. But he's going to do it, and when he does, he will take away their sins. How do we know this? Because they've been made enemies for our sakes. Are the Jews still not enemies for our sakes? Yep. Has the fullness of the Gentiles come in yet? Nope. 
Has he come on Mount Zion as the deliverer yet? Nope. Which means what? He still has a covenant for them. Hello. There it is right there. I'd say in black and white, but this is a, a rainbow of color for you. There it is right there. It's right there. Let's keep going. Let's see how this plays out. Remember how I said, so much of this you're going to see relate to these chapters to years. Like where we're going to go now, we're going to see Psalms 24, we're going to see Psalms 25, and then we're going to see other places. We'll look at the time frame of Psalms 24. In it, you're going to see it's a prophetic picture of like the very end, almost on top of this line of the sixth year of seals. And then in 25, you're going to see the wording of events that take place at some point within the seventh year of seals, which is the great multitude has come in. And within some point in this seventh year is when he's going to make that covenant. I'll show it to you. Watch this. Let's go to Psalms 24. And look at how Psalms 24 starts. A Psalm of David, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Well, how about that? The earth, okay? The world and the fullness thereof is the Lord's. Who does the world represent, guys? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. Remember, we talk about this in relation to was, is, and is to come. The was is from the beginning of creations to Christ. The is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib, and the is to come is from the pre-trib to the end. We also know this relation is Luke pre, Mark mid, Matthew post. The pre-trib is the Gentile bride of Christ. And then the, the seals and the time of Mark is related to the house of Israel for which the Gentiles have been grafted into. So that means over the last 2,000 years or so, they've been growing together, okay? Which is the world, which is the church that we know isn't ready. They're not prepared. They're not diligently seeking and searching the Lord, which means they won't be part of the pre-trib Gentile bride. There are qualifications. Scripture tells us, just like Enoch, okay? You have to have faith first and foremost. But then you have to believe that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What's the reward? To not taste of death like Enoch did, which is connected to pre-trib. So the fullness of the earth, which is the fullness of the Gentiles, doesn't happen until the end of the six years of seals. And here we are in Psalms 24. And as Psalms 24 here, in this picture, it's like being right at this, this line between the end of the sixth and the beginning of the seventh year. And what does this relate to? Well, it's a picture of the end of the sixth year of seals, right? So if we go to Revelation chapter six, a picture of the end of the sixth year of seals, who do we see coming? Revelation 6, 16 and 17, and said unto the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. What are they seeing? They are seeing something coming from heaven. And they are all rich, poor. Everybody's hiding in the rocks, in the caves. Mountains fall on us, hide us. Because they're seeing the Lord coming. This is not the end of tribulation and connected to, to the seventh trumpet. This is the end of the sixth year of seals. And everybody's in a panic. It's like a picture of the end of chapter 24. <clears throat> Excuse me, of Psalms chapter 24. So if we go look at it, and it says, the fullness of the earth, which is the Lord's, and then we go to verse 3 of Psalms 24, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, 
How many videos have we done on vanity connected to the Mark group, the, the group of light? Nor sworn deceitfully. So where are they looking to go up to? They're looking to ascend the mountain of the Lord. What is the mountain of the Lord? It's Mount Zion. It's Mount Zion that they're going to see coming down from heaven at the end of the sixth year of seals, and they're all freaking out in a panic. And when he comes, he's coming for what? The fullness of the Gentiles, the fullness of the world. And the Gentiles, remember, they're grafted in with the house of Israel. So we see the end of the sixth year of seals, and we see the end of the sixth seal. What else do we know? If we go to Luke chapter 21 again, we see the warning that comes. And in Luke 21 is the is the stuff that happens in the above before the 14 years begin. But then once it begins, okay? When you see Jerusalem compassed by army compassed with armies, know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And then they're to flee. Well, when does this take place? This takes place at the beginning, okay? At the, when the Son of Man's 40 days come to an end, which would be, I think, the 26th of Elul, he has warned them. And now, for the next three days, the, the compassing about is going to take place, as we read in Luke 21, that Jesus was warning about. When they see this compassing about happen, they're to flee to get out of Jerusalem. Once they do, the day and hour after the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes on day 50, and they go out from Jerusalem, the remnant workers go out from Jerusalem to begin the, the, the time of seals, the 14 years will begin, then on the day and hour no one knows, Syria will be with that group, whoever's with them, that have been compassing about Jerusalem, and they will be destroyed on the Feast of Trumpets. That's what's going to happen. So when we're seeing this, it says, depart, flee, don't let anybody enter. For Now listen to this. He's saying, because this is now the beginning of tribulation, okay? For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Okay? He's saying this is the beginning now of tribulation. This is the red horse rider when Syria attacks and destroys Jerusalem on the Feast of Trumpets. That is the beginning of the 14 years. And look at what it says. For these be the, be the days of vengeance, that all things that are written may be fulfilled. Woe to them that are with child and them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. When? Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. How long is this trotting down going to take place? Till the fullness of the Gentiles. Till the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When is this time of the Gentiles being fulfilled? It's being fulfilled as we saw in Romans and just as we saw here at the fullness of the world, at the fullness of the Gentiles when Romans 8 said that time would be when he's going to come on Mount Zion. The hill, the mountain of the Lord. If we go to Revelation, watch this. We go to Revelation chapter 14 and look at what we see. Revelation 14, verse 1. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. So the Lord, the deliverer, is standing on Mount Zion. And with him, the 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Okay. Well, if we see him coming and we know that he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth seal, as we saw, and we know it's the time of the fullness of the Gentiles, we know it's the time of Rachel, and it's the end of what? It's the end of the first six years of seals. So if this is six years later at the end of seals, it'll be what? At the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, and what's going to happen? It's the time of the grapes, and it's the time of the spring wheat. And what do you have? The 144,000 that represent the first fruits of the grapes, of the grape harvest, 
And then what do you have? The great multitude rapture. So as we saw, they come in <laughs> and they're there for the time of tabernacle. So they're ready at that time. But what do we know? We know that they won't observe it until about six months, maybe seven months later, either at first Passover or at second Passover. You see how the order works? If that's the fullness at the end of seals or when the Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion and there he is standing with the 144,000 on heavenly Mount Zion and they're sealed first because they're the grape harvest, the first fruits of the grapes. And then you have the great multitude rapture, which is the Leah, uh, the Rachel spring wheat. But it can't be observed. So even though their time is here, they're observing time. They can't actually go in till a period of time is over. Why is there this period of time of six or maybe even seven months? And why do I believe it's actually seven months more likely? Well, let me show you. Because this period of time is also, at the end of the sixth year of seals, is also Ezekiel 39. So again, if you go to the chapters to years, and you go to chapter 39, you're going to see it's it's kind of like chapter 24. It's right on the, the end, right just above the line. When the Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion and the whole world is going to see him coming and they're going to say, who can ascend the hill of the Lord except those who have been clean, right? Who have a pure heart and are clean. We know that they're going to be ascending the hill of the Lord at some point. And then what do we see in, in Revelation 14? There's 144,000 standing with the with the lamb on Mount Zion. And in the seventh year of seals. We have the 144,000 being sealed first. So when we come now to Ezekiel and we see Ezekiel 39, it's giving us a prophetic picture of the same timing that where where the Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion. This is the Ezekiel 39 war. And this is where the Lord destroys the enemy. And look at what happens. It says, Ezekiel 39, and they that dwell in the cities of Israel fire upon the bows and arrows and hand, and, and hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire for seven years. How is he going to burn them with fire for seven years? People will tell you that's, that's the war that happens at the end of tribulation. And then for seven years during the millennial reign, starting in the Jubilee, seven years, they're going to burn those weapons. Nope. What you see here is this is the end of the sixth year of seals. And when they all came against them and he destroys them, what's going to happen? You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years where they're burning weapons, the seventh year of seals, six years of trumpets. And when those seven years are over, what do you think happens? They're going to beat their plowshares back into swords, just like you read in scripture. I think it's Joel chapter three and other places. And what are they going to do? They're going to beat them back into weapons. And this is going to be the second battle. This is the first. This is the second. The Lord has two swords. That he told us in Luke chapter 20, he had two swords, and there's going to be one here, and after seven years, one here. So why is this important, and how does it relate to what I'm saying about when the rapture group comes in? They'll see them at the end of the sixth year of seals. This Ezekiel 39 war takes place at the very end of the sixth year of seals. But then what does it say next in Ezekiel 39? We can now understand the burning of weapons for seven years. And then what does it say? In verse 12, Ezekiel 39, and seven months, listen carefully, shall the house of Israel. Why not the house of Judah? Why not the house of Israel and Judah? Only the house of Israel. And seven months shall the house of Israel be bearing them that they may cleanse the land. What do you think that means? That means if we use this year as the same time frame 
of where uh, trumpets is, right? The Feast of Trumpets, okay, early. And we use this as being seven years later or, or six years later. And here's the Lord. He's come at the end of the sixth year of seals at the day and hour no one knows, just like we read in Mark's discourse. That's why there's a reason it's not in Luke's discourse. He comes on the day and hour no one knows. He's destroyed the Ezekiel 39 war. And now it's the time of the grapes and the time of the of the spring wheat. The grapes are sealed first. That's why Revelation 7, that's why you see the 144 there. They're on Mount Zion with them, just like it said, who shall ascend to the mount? And what do you have? Then you have the wheat. Then you have the great multitude rapture that's going to come in. But when it says they're coming in, connected with the house of Israel, and the Gentiles are grafted in with them, what does it say? It says for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven months. They're going to be burying the dead to cleanse the land. So once the land is cleansed, what are you going to see? It's second Passover. It will equal the time of second Passover. And this makes complete sense because Jesus already fulfilled the Passover lamb. So the great multitude rapture, which is his Rachel group, that portion coming in, is the typology of, in relation to the wheat and the harvest, they're not going to come in on the same Passover as he did when he corrected, when, when he saved us all. They're going to be connected to the second Passover. Hence, precisely seven months later. This is why the Jews wait with this new wheat and say that it can't be used till the following year on the second day of Passover. The actual reality is probably that it shouldn't be able to get used till the second day of second Passover. That's the real prophetic picture. And this is what we can understand from Ezekiel chapter 39. So all of this now only brings us into the... Give me a second here. All of this only brings us let me go to this chart instead. All of this only brings us into the seventh month of the seventh year of seals. So we've had the 50 days. We know what happens. We have the six years of seals. At the end of the sixth year, they see him coming on heavenly Mount Zion. <laughs> it's the fullness of the earth that he's coming for, which is the fullness of the Gentiles. Just like Romans said, at which point... The Gentiles will be, the, the completeness will come in. And who's going to get to go up? And you go to Revelation 7 right after it. And the 144,000 are standing on heavenly Mount Zion. And we know it'll be about seven months later before the land is cleaned. And then they could officially be there having gone up and be able to go in, which is connected to the great multitude rapture, which we're able to prove here from Ezekiel chapter 39. This is this is the end. This is the fullness of the Gentiles coming to an end at the end of the sixth year of seals. Which means the, the covenant that the Lord is going to make is connected to some point in the seventh year of seals. Clearly evidenced and given to us in Romans 11, as we just saw a little while ago. Where was it? Okay. Clearly, seeing that the time of the fullness of the Gentiles comes in at the end of the sixth year of seals. They see him coming on Zion. He's the deliverer in Zion. And then he says he has a covenant with them, at which point he'll take away their sins. Fascinating how that works. Do you understand this is unequivocally prophecy? This isn't something fulfilled. It's not until the fullness of the Gentiles. It's not e until he's come on Mount Zion, which means this is a different covenant. This is a covenant that he has with them that he's going to make afterwards when the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, which means after the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, after that Remember, they're grafted in with the house of Israel. 
So when the house of Israel comes in, which is the Gentiles also grafted in, which is the world and the fullness of the Gentiles, then Judah will also come in. And it'll be connected to this covenant that he makes with them. And how fitting is that, brothers and sisters? How fitting is it that when you understand what the Jews have understood, what these rabbis that teach on the end of days and prophecy have understood, is they know there's going to be a war that's going to break out against the earth. They know at a point after that Israel is going to come in, that what they call the fullness of Israel, which we would say the Gentiles grafted in, the fullness of the Gentiles, which the house of Israel is connected to, then what do we have? They, they're they expecting that when their Messiah, Ben Joseph, comes, he's going to what? Destroy the enemies that came against them. That's precisely what he does at the end of the six year of seals in the Ezekiel 39 war. Then he gathers them. And they're going to be coming back to the land. And once they come back to the land and the world has experienced this and they saw the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion, what is he going to do? He's, of course, going to make a covenant with all nations. We know that he makes a covenant with all nations at that point. We know it sometime in this seventh year, probably towards the very end. We know it's not during the first half or the first seven months because they're burying the bones. They're burying the bones. They're cleansing the land. We know the temple hasn't been built yet. We know that there might have been a declaration to rebuild the city and the streets and the temple. Right? That's exactly what Daniel chapter 9 told us. When you go to Daniel 9, listen to what it says. We know that after Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed, exactly as it says, Daniel 9, 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, to restore Jerusalem, which means it was destroyed, and to build Jerusalem, so to restore and to build it, unto Messiah the Prince, is going to be seven years away. You see? There's going to be a declaration to rebuild it. But it won't get rebuilt in the seven years of seals. And that's where the world of seven years of thinking people have missed. We know that the only thing that's going to get built during these first seven years is what Zechariah tells us in the 14 years. You go into the midst of the seven uh, in the midst of the seals. And we see right here. That Zerubbabel, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. We know that the modern day Zerubbabel who is the Messiah David, okay? He is the Messiah David at the end of seals. <coughs> and the Messiah Ben Joseph, who is Jesus, the high priest and king, is the, as we've taught on, is the uh, um, Joshua type from Zechariah chapter 6. So how fitting in Zechariah chapter 6, and we know the Lord is coming down at the end of the sixth seal, and here he is, he has his crowns of gold. He's Joshua, Messiah, the high priest. And then there's the branch who's Zerubbabel who laid the foundation and he will build the temple because Messiah is the high priest and king, the Melchizedek. And Zerubbabel is the branch. He is the one who's going to complete the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple. And the rule will be between them both. But the high priest is Messiah Jesus. He is the Messiah Ben Joseph that the Jews are waiting for. And we know he is the one in greater authority, even though it's between them both. He has the greater authority, of course, because he's the one directly connected to the Father. And this is exactly what we know the Jews are waiting for. They're waiting for a Messiah. If you talk to any Jew that knows their scripture 
and we shared one just about a month ago. We shared that video clip. It was it was fantastic because everything he said, we know it in order, in a way that he hasn't understood it, but he knows the, the play out of events. And he knew that war comes first, that things happen to the world and to the Gentiles. Then Israel would be restored after the Lord, Messiah, the, the Messiah ben Joseph comes, destroys the enemies, and then the two of them will reign, and the city and the streets and the temple will be built. And you see, the Jews know that it's going to be the Lord and their Messiah, King, uh, Messiah ben David, who is going to rebuild it. And the Christians say, no, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. You're looking for the Antichrist who's about to rebuild the temple and you're going to fall for him when he steps into it and declares himself God. Nope. That is completely misunderstood. Because the Christians only see these seven years. But they mix these first seven with these seven and say all of it is going to take place during this. And so the whole thing is a ball of mess and confusion. The understanding of it is revealed here, and we've been doing it for over six years with greater and greater and greater detail with every passing week. So if Messiah is coming at the end of the sixth seal, it's the Ezekiel 39 war, he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, and the ones who can go up to Mount Zion, and we see the 144 with them, then we see in seven months where they're, where they're cleaning the city uh, uh, and, and cleansing the city. And we know that the great multitude rapture, it, it, the, the harvest is ready at that time, but it's not official to bring in. And we see seven months later, you see what's going on? This is all the time of the Messiah. This is the point where the Jews have been looking for, for, for thousands of years. This is the point at the end of the sixth year. And to start all of this, this is what they're looking for. And then when the temple will begin. This is what the Jews have been looking for. And they have understood correctly, which is why what, what uh, Paul tells us in Romans 11, the Jews already know it. It's the Christians that are confused in it. The Jews already know it. They're waiting for the deliverer to come out of Zion. And he's blinded them to the other truths of Christ for our sakes. For our sakes. So now what happens? Now what happens? We're in the seventh year. He's destroyed their enemies. The heavenly Mount Zion is there. There's a group that can go up and we saw them there on Mount Zion with the lamb. The great multitude rapture comes in, which we'll talk about as well. Let's see what goes next. Watch this. Let's go to <clears throat> Psalms 25. Let's see what we can now see connected to Psalms chapter 25. And of course, how fitting that Psalms 25 is connected to some point in the seventh year of seals in the chapters to years. You want to see something really wild? Psalms 25 has 22 verses. Want to know why it's interesting? Because the big picture, which we know not only in all of creation as 22,000 years, but the truth of the end of days is just as their alphabet, 22 chapters. I mean, uh, 22 years. It was the seven easy years that are coming to an end. Seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. They are the final sevens of the seven times seven years. And 22 is the final jubilee. So it's interesting that it has 22, chapter, uh, 22 verses in it. And you want to know what else is really interesting? Check this out. Look at the, the wordings we can read in it. Watch this. Verse 14. What is verse 14, guys? What would be verse 14? Ah, it would be the seventh year of seals. Let's see what he says in it. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will 
show them his covenant. <laughs> I love it how it works out every time. Oh my goodness, it's unbelievable when you understand these things. Isn't that the same type of wording he just told us that we just read in Romans chapter 11? Let's go look at that wording again. Let's see what he said. And he will show them his covenant. Let's see that Romans one again. Watch this. When do we know he's going to show them his covenant? And so Israel... And so all Israel shall be saved that is written. Uh, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So when is he going to have this covenant with them? When he takes away their sins at the fullness of the Gentiles, which is the seventh year of seals. And it's the 14th in the big picture. And in chapter 25 of 22 verses. The 14th one is where he says he's going to show them his covenant. I love it how it all works out. I mean, we're not talking about sometimes. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of places that we've shown these things. Now watch this. What else do we know? If we go to, <clears throat> let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31 okay so we just saw in psalms the connection to when he's going to reveal that covenant we saw in romans where he's going to make this covenant once the fullness of the gentiles has come in well the fullness of the gentiles doesn't come in fully until about the sixth or seventh month in the seventh year well watch this we've seen this before right I love this piece of scripture. I remember when a sister of ours found it, I, I, my head almost exploded. Why? Because we know that the, the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals, this is at the day and hour no one knows, like Mark's discourse, when the Lord is seen coming and they're all hiding in the rocks, right? This is at the end of six years. And then we know it's, grapes and we know it's the great multitude but then the great multitude has at least six months to pass over or maybe seven months <coughs> as it sometimes appears <coughs> as we saw in uh in ezekiel that it might be seven months to second passover okay and we know that it's completely related to spring wheat being new wheat that can't be observed until the time of Passover six to seven months later. So now let's look at this. In Jeremiah 31, 8, behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth. Okay, this is talking about the great multitude rapture. And with the blind and with them, the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travailed together, a great multitude, which means a great multitude see a great company meaning a great multitude shall return thither okay this is the great multitude rapture we know and we have understood that this is connected to the time of passover as we've just been talking about well it was revealed i don't know if it was two or three years ago now that that wording when you go to the original translation in the septuagint Jeremiah chapter 31, using the Septuagint, <clears throat> let's have another read. Verse 8, Behold, I bring them from the north and will gather them from the end of the earth to the feast of Passover. To the feast of Passover. And the people shall beget a great multitude, and they shall return thither. So at the feast of Passover, the great multitude, hello, I have loved that piece of scripture for a long time. <clears throat> but when it was confirmed that the great multitude rapture happens at Passover, which we have understood from the Leah Rachel story, it was it was a mind blower. It was so incredible. And then, of course, for a long time, 
this was also confusing in Jeremiah 31 9 because we keep getting told that Jesus is of the tribe of Judah well then how is he Ephraim his firstborn well we now know the answer right we know that he's he, he's a portion of these different ones we showed the video of the four messiahs because he's coming in four types and when he comes at the end of seals he's coming as messiah ben joseph or some would say messiah ephraim because he is the firstborn of joseph okay i loved it when this was revealed it's so incredible everything that we have understood these have brought greater confirmation too. It's fantastic. Well, it gets better. Don't forget, we're talking about the covenant. So if this is when Messiah ben Joseph is here, or is Messiah Ephraim the firstborn, who is the high priest king now, as Joshua was, and we see that the great multitude rapture happens at a Passover in the seventh year of seals, what should we see next? Something about his covenant? Maybe something about his covenant? Well, let's go have a look. Jeremiah 31. Let's go down to 31. Check it out. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, comma, and with the house of Judah. Now, all of a sudden, we have house of Judah mentioned. Remember the ones bearing the bones to clean the, cleanse the land for seven months? And we know that the Gentiles are grafted in with the house of Israel. And so what is he doing? So now he's got his new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Well, wait a second. This covenant has to be the one at the end of seals. Just like Romans said, it's not until the deliverer comes out of Zion. It's not until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in before he will show his covenant and make this covenant that he has with Judah. Clearly. That's what all of this has been showing us tonight. So then it says in verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts and they will and and I will be and sorry and will be their God and they shall be my people. Huh. Starts with. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. You see with the house of Israel and afterwards with the house of Judah. Watch what happens. So. We're seeing the order. We're seeing that the Lord has come on heavenly Mount Zion. Okay, look at even verse 6. For there shall be a day that watchmen upon Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. This, this is exactly the same conversation from Romans. This is the same from from uh, uh, Psalms 24. This is like the 144, the watchman of 144 saying, let us go to Mount Zion. And then there's a remnant of people and then what happens? Bang! The great multitude rapture. And who's there? Messiah ben Joseph or Messiah Ephraim the firstborn. Then he talks about making the covenant that he said he would do with them afterwards. And it is this new covenant with the house of Israel and with Judah. But you see, the house of Israel came in first just as the one bearing the bones. But is Judah going to come in right away? Yes, 
I believe Judah comes in after the great multitude rapture. The Jews will come back. And how do we know this? Watch this. We go to Zechariah chapter 8. And when we go to Zechariah chapter 8, we're now done with this seventh year, but we're going to come to it. We're now in Zechariah chapter 8, okay? Which is the equivalent of the first year of trumpets. And in Zechariah 8, now the mountain of the Lord, Mount Zion, is firmly established. It's been there now for a year. Could you imagine what this is going to look like? Well, you have to understand if they're so panicked at the end of six years of seals when they see this coming and they're saying mountains and rocks fall on us because they're terrified of what they're seeing coming. They're seeing whatever this is, whatever this thing is going to look like, a, a huge mountain ship. I, I have no idea, but it looks like it will be in the clouds over Jerusalem, maybe sitting on the mountains. I don't know. But by this point in Zechariah 8, the first year of trumpets, it's now been there for a year. And then it says in verse 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with a great jealousy. I was jealous for her with a great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth and the mountain of the Lord, the holy mountain. You see, because they've been going up to that mountain now. Then we see in verse 9, some, some verse 9 and 10, I share a lot over the years. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong. You that hear in these days these words by the, the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. Zerubbabel laid it during seals. Only the foundation got laid during seals. Now, first year of trumpets is starting. And it's the Lord declaring the rebuilding of the city streets and temple now. Not the Antichrist, not the beast. It is the Lord who's there. And as we saw in chapter 4 of Zechariah, it is Zerubbabel who laid the foundation. And it is Zerubbabel, it said, who will complete the task of rebuilding the temple. He is the one overseeing the entire of the rebuilding. And Messiah Jesus, Messiah ben Ephraim, Messiah ben Joseph, son Ephraim, is the high priest and king. They're the ones that you saw are called the two witnesses. So this modern day Zerubbabel and Messiah are two witnesses according to Zechariah. Go read chapter 4. The two candlesticks and the two trees and, and, and the oil and the anointing. And the rule shall be between them both. They're the two witnesses. So we're seeing here the city and the streets, and now the temple is about to get rebuilt on the foundation that was laid during seals. He then goes on to say in verse 10, For before these days there was no hire for man, nor hire for beast, neither was there any peace. Remember, at the red horse rider, peace was removed, and destruction came upon Jerusalem. To him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. That's the red horse rider. Okay? But now, will I not be unto the residue, sorry, but now I will not be unto the residue of this people as in the former days, saith the Lord of hosts. Now the fruit and the increase of the land, okay, the ground, and the fruit shall give their increase. The crops of grapes and wheat, right, have given their increase. Now listen to what it says in verse 13. And it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah, comma, and house of Israel, so will I save you. And you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. You see, Judah's there too. By the time we get here, Judah is there. When we saw in, in uh, Jeremiah 31, we saw the, the declaration in the 144, those can go up the mountain. We see the great multitude rapture come in. And then we see 
a declaration of him with his covenant that he's now going to make known to them. And it was to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. But it was clearly after the house of Israel was brought in, be, which is connected to the, to the Gentiles that are grafted in, because there was the bearing of the bones for seven months, which would lead to believe it's not just Passover, but second Passover when this happens, which means in the latter portion of the second half of the seventh year of seals would be where the Lord made his covenant. After the great multitude rapture. So you have the 144, they see them. Then there's the 144, who's going to go up the mountain? A group goes up the mountain, they're sealed with the understanding and, and, the, and, and the name of the Father. The great multitude rapture comes in, which is at Passover, or most likely second Passover, which means you're already seven months through the seventh year of seals, which means there's only six, maybe more likely like five months left in the end of the seventh year of seals. And we see that at that point, Judah is also now there with the house of Israel. And when we get to Zechariah chapter eight, and it's the beginning of trumpets, and we know the city and the streets and the temple are gonna be built, where do you think we are? Where do you think we are? Let's go back to Daniel 9. Where are we at this point in, in chapter 8 of Zechariah? We're at the end of the seven weeks or seven years. Now Messiah is here. And they're going to what? Over the next about three and a half years, that starts in the seventh year of trumpets, Zechariah chapter 8, they're going to start rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple and wall again, even in troublous times. This is exactly the same thing, again, that we've covered a lot in Psalms 110, when now the Lord said, said on my, uh, the Lord said unto my Lord, said at the right hand, the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. You see, it's still going to be in the midst of these things. You got to remember, there are still going to be enemies, and there's still going to be trumpet judgments taking place. Remember, the first four trumpet judgments are going to be happening around the world while the city streets and temple and wall are being rebuilt. And what is he called? He's called the priest after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through the kings of the earth with his wrath. But he is Melchizedek. This is the exact same time at the end of seals and the beginning of, excuse me, in the beginning of trumpets. So when you come to Daniel 9, and you see that in verse, um, in the midst of verse 25, this three score in two weeks is the first half of trumpets, after the seven weeks or after the seven years. There's your seven years of seals. We've described those things that happen up to about seven months into the seventh year. And then when the seven years of trumpets begin, there's your rebuilding that's starting. And when this rebuilding is starting, look what Zechariah says. In Zechariah chapter 8, as we saw, who's there? Not only Judah, but Israel as well. And it says, let your hands be strong. For their hands to be strong and everything, that means if the rebuilding is going to take place, clearly all of the cleansing is now over. You got it? All the cleansing has now happened in the first seven months of the seventh year. And that leaves only five months approximately in the seventh year of seals. And when that five months is over, they're now going to start rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple. And Judah is also there. Which means Judah must have come in in the latter portion of of the seventh year of seals. Well, doesn't it make complete sense? Doesn't it make complete sense? Of course it does. As I said earlier, if you go to any Jew who studies or a rabbi who studies their prophecy, they know 
that they are looking for their Messiah who will destroy the enemies that destroyed them and after they are destroyed, brings them back into the land. And when they're brought back into the land, the rebuilding of the temple will take place. The Jews have understood these things. But the Christians failing to understand what comes first has been so against what the Jews say because they've missed the first half that belongs to the sleeping church. And so what do they do? They butt heads. They disagree. And the Jews, really behind the scenes, don't like that, that don't like Christ are all against the Christians and behind closed doors really hate the Christians sometimes to their face too. And the Christians come against the Jews and say, oh, no, you suckers, you're going to fall. You're going to fall for the Antichrist. And they're saying, no, we're not. Because when Messiah, our Messiah comes, he's going to destroy our enemies and then he's going to rebuild the third temple. Or he's going to be here during the rebuilding of the third temple. Because Messiah doesn't build it, right? Or a Messiah builds it, not the Messiah, right? There's two of them. There's our Messiah, Jesus, who is their Messiah, who will reveal the covenant to them after the fullness of the Gentiles. You hear what I'm saying? After the fullness of the Gentiles, the deliverer who's in Zion will reveal his covenant to them. Which means if it's after the fullness of the Gentiles, which is about six or seven months into the seventh year, it means in the second half of trumpets, five or six months, is when Judah comes in, them having recognized they've, he's destroyed all their enemies, and now they're being gathered back. And then the rebuilding takes place. The Jews aren't wrong, guys. But they've been blinded for our sakes. And because the world of church hasn't understood the revelation yet, they butt heads and believe prophetically that these Jews are going to fall for the Antichrist. It couldn't be further from the truth. They're going to be removed from the land and fleeing throughout all, all nations. Isn't it wild to understand? So what's happening in this seventh year, going into this eighth year, or this 14th, say, going into the 15th, right? Because now, this is when the rebuilding takes place after he's made that covenant. Well, <laughs> let's keep going. Let's see where this continues to play out. What if we go to Revelation chapter 8? This is where I believe, and have for a long time, that is the seventh seal which is about five months, five, six months, I believe it's five months, as it says, Revelation 8, 1, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. I believe the about the space of half an hour, I believe relates to one hour being like a year. And about half an hour is about six months. And if we know that it looks like seven months first because the land has to be cleansed, then once the land is cleansed and everybody's brought in, then from that point forward, there's about five months, which is about half an hour, okay? About half the time, about half a year. So what is about? Maybe it's five months, maybe it's six months, maybe it's seven months. I believe it's five months. Look at what the word means with silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Peace. To hold peace. It's calm. It's hushed. It's silent. I don't believe it's only happening in heaven, but it'll be happening in earth as well. Why is there a silence for about six months or five months on the earth? Because he's destroyed his enemies, the enemies of, of, of Israel, right? The enemies of his land. They all came against at the end of the sixth year, Ezekiel 39 battle, the events of, of the seventh year, and now in the about half a year, 
after it's been cleansed, the great multitude is in. Judah has now been made known as well. So Judah is also in. Now there's a time of silence. So what is he doing in this holding of peace? I believe this is where the Lord has made his covenant. This is where the Lord has now revealed his covenant. So let's keep going. Watch. Let's keep going with this. We go to Genesis chapter 15. Look at what happens in Genesis 15. Okay. So Genesis 15 is like the, the very beginning, if you will, of trumpets. Okay. And in Genesis 15, we see in verse 18, in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying unto thy seed, have I given this land? Remember? So he's made in the seventh seal, he has made peace with all nations. Now, at the beginning of trumpets, now we know not only the house of Israel, but the house of Judah is there. Just as we saw in Zechariah chapter 8. Where is it? Just as we saw in Zechariah chapter 8. Let your hands be strong. They're about to start rebuilding. And we see the house of Judah is there with the house of Israel. Well, according to Genesis, now you can see this confirmation of the covenant that he made with Abraham. Unto his seed he has given them this land. Well, guess what? Remember chapters to years? There's chapter 15. Chapter 15 of Genesis, lo and behold, the first year of trumpets. Lo and behold, the first year of trumpets. He has now confirmed the covenant, made, or not confirmed, he has now made this covenant with Judah, with the people that were blinded until the fullness had come in. In the seventh year, at the end of that fullness, he makes uh, 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 peace with all nations and he gives his covenant with Judah and with all of Israel. Just like he said, just like he said in Jeremiah 31, which would be after this period of time. Well, it gets better because look what happens. Here's where he makes this covenant, right? We saw it in Zechariah 8. Well, let's go to Zechariah chapter 11. Uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 11. Let's confirm that, that this Abraham connection and when he's going to get his covenant. Let's see if we can see in the New Testament where it's confirming this for us. Remember? Remember Enoch? Remember Enoch? Enoch is the picture of the pre-trib. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Right? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek. What is this reward for diligently seeking and investigating and searching out the Lord? It's the pre-trib, not tasting of death. Then what do we have? Then we have Noah, which represents the 40 days. There's the pre-trib. There's the 40 days of the Lord. And then what happens? Then we know the next picture with Abraham in verse 8 is a picture of what? The end of seals. When the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion. And look at what it says. By faith, Abraham, the one we were looking for, when he was called to go out of a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. Now listen to this. For he looked for a city 
which has foundations, whose builder and maker is the Antichrist? No, God. He's looking for a city which has foundations. What did Zechariah say? Foundations were laid in the fourth year. Zerubbabel had, had laid the foundations. Then we come to chapter 8. In chapter 8 was what? Right here, which was the 15th in the big picture or the first year of trumpets, which is what? Genesis chapter 15. And so here comes Abraham, who is looking for a place that has foundations, whose builder and 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 whose builder is God. And then we come to Zechariah chapter 8. And in Zechariah chapter 8, it says, let your hands be strong to start building where the foundation has already been laid, that the temple can be built. And here he is saying, before this time, nobody could come in because I set everybody against each other, which begins at the red horse rider, the start of tribulation. But now let your hands be ready, O house of Judah and Israel. Hebrews 11 which is something we have known for a long time of the pre, the 40 days of the Son of Man, the end of seals, and then Sarah in relation to the bo uh, uh, Isaac being born, who is the prophetic picture of the Lord returning, feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end. Pre, 40 days, mid and post. It's called Luke in order. Luke chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. It's the same storyline we're being given. And who? is the one who was looking for the foundations whose builder and maker is God. Abraham receiving the promise of his inheritance. And in chapter 15, God told Abraham, with the covenant made with Abraham, unto thy seed this land is given. And there they all are to start trumpets in the land that was promised and they're all brought back in. It's awesome. It's awesome. Which means, <clears throat> as I said, the Lord makes peace with all nations right here. He makes, he makes the covenant right here. This is the covenant. This is the covenant that he makes. You could say in that second half of the seventh year of seals is when he makes peace with all the nations. Wouldn't it make sense that he's going to be making peace, that all nations were now at peace in relation to, you know, that, that he's made some sort of covenant, if you will, with them? Of course. He's just destroyed all the enemies that were at war that turned to come against him, seeing them coming on heavenly Mount Zion. And he destroyed them all just as the Jews understood and were looking for when their Messiah comes. Pretty wild, right? So we know it's the very end of the seventh year of seals to the beginning of trumpets is the complete connection to the covenant that he had promised that he would make after the Gentiles had come in, when he had to be on heavenly Mount Zion, which is absolutely everything that we read in Romans chapter 11, proving without a doubt this was all prophetic to the end of seals and the fullness of the Gentiles. I love it, man. It's so beautiful. To be able to see the scriptures just explode in Revelation. But guys, do you know what happens when the Lord makes a covenant? Something has to happen, right? When a covenant is made, there's always something that has to happen. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Let me show you what happens, what the, what the scriptures tell us. Okay, which, by the way, I mean, Hebrews 9 is so jam-packed with great things, too. Okay. Um, 
let's start. Maybe let's start in 14. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, uh, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, without works, purge, uh, uh, without, sorry, without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament that were under the first testament they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance for where a testament and what did he come to do he came to secure or to you know the new testament the mediator right he came to take care of it listen to this for where a testament Okay, where a covenant is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Uh oh. We just saw and understood and have revealed for a long time and now can see it that the Lord is making this covenant with them. That he said he would make known to them after the fullness of the Gentiles. If he's making a covenant with them at the end of the fullness of the Gentiles, which means it's a New Testament, right? Not like the New Testament of Scripture, but he's making what? He's making a covenant. For where a covenant is made, there is necessity of death. Please, if you're newer, this is not a video I want you to start in. However, if you're already in this far, I want you to understand. I am not saying this. I'm showing you the scriptures. There's your great multitude rapture. He is the firstborn. Messiah Ephraim. Messiah ben Joseph, which is the end of seals. And he says... That it's after the fullness of the Gentiles. Which after this fullness of the Gentiles. Which we saw in the seventh year of seals. That he says he will make a new covenant. You see. After those days. He is making this covenant. That means. That the Lord who is making this covenant, who is the high priest, Yeshua, Joshua type, who is the Melchizedek, who is the Messiah ben Joseph, the Messiah Ephraim, of the two, which the other is the Messiah David, who is Zerubbabel, during this time. It says that if there is a covenant, there is also necessity of death. Verse 17. For a testament or a covenant is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. Yikes. It's a terrible thing to think. To possibly imagine that the Lord would do this again. But it's all over scripture. And when we understand his purpose for it, it's of course glorious. I don't want suffering and war coming out against the Lord. I know none of us do. But the scriptures tell us it's going to happen. Do you think there's a reason why the Jews knowing this war and then their Messiah Ben Joseph is coming and they know that the city and the streets and the temple are going to get rebuilt. And then they know a war is going to break out against them. And that Messiah ben Joseph is going to be killed in war. How do you think they know that? How do you think I know it? How do you think you guys have come to understand it? Did we come to understand it through the writings of, of, of the Jews and their, and their Midrash and all that other stuff? Nope. It was all revealed in Scripture. 
It's not till after we've had the revelation for quite a while. And then people start sharing things that we see what they understand. And we could line it up perfectly into the revelation of Scripture. So if he's making his new covenant there, and we know that he's one of the two witnesses, and we go right here, like I said earlier, to Zechariah 4, there's, see the candlestick, the two olive trees, and it says it's Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is going to be laying the foundation, and he's also going to be the one to finish the building of it. You see the two olive trees, right? There are the two olive branches. There are the two anointed ones. You go to chapter 6, and you find out that the two anointed ones are Messiah ben Joseph or Joshua, who is Yeshua Jesus, who is the high priest like Melchizedek. And you find out that the other one is the branch, who is the one who laid the foundation, who's going to build the temple. And that the rule will be between them both. Between who both? The two anointed ones. So if it's between the two anointed ones, who are the two anointed ones? They're the two witnesses. How do we understand how this works? Well, now knowing that this covenant has been made, knowing that there has to be this breaking of the covenant, there has to be something to cause this covenant to happen so that the testator has bloodshed. Because without the shedding of blood, the covenant is, is of no strength. I didn't say that. I read it in Hebrews. So look what happens if we go to Zechariah 11, <clears throat> which means for about three and a half years, the city, streets, and temple were being built. So we go to Daniel 9, and we go back to the same conversation. There's your seven years as weeks, as years, individual years, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years. You're about three and a half years, which puts you in the 11th year, and the city streets wall, and we know the temple is being rebuilt. What happens is after <coughs> those about three and a half years or in the 11th year, Messiah, Messiah himself is cut off. This doesn't mean he's killed. This is where he's cut off. So we should be able to find something in the 11th year, which is three years and about half where he gets cut off. Well, if the whole storyline is laid out in Zechariah and we go to Zechariah chapter 11, it's exactly what we see. The vintage of old is cast down. You guys know all this. This is Satan who has lost his battle in heaven. Satan's being cast down. And then we see uh, three shepherds I cut off in one month. Verse 10, and I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant, which I made with all people. See that? Which I made with all people. Just like we read at the beginning. It is the Lord who made this covenant with all people. With what? With all these nations. Okay? He's the one that made this covenant. And what does he have to do? He's got to break it. And what does it say? And it was broken in that day. So sometime in the 11th year, about 10 and a half years into tribulation, about three and a half years into trumpet judgments, the covenant is broken. And look at the price they gave for him. They say 30 pieces of silver. This is something we've covered numerous times here in this ministry. <clears throat> what does it mean? Why was he given um, the, the 30 pieces of silver? Why here in Zechariah is it 30 pieces of silver? Well, because only 
in Matthew's gospel, remember, we're talking about the seven years of trumpets, which is to Judah. Matthew is the seven years of trumpets, which is to Judah. And it's why in the story of, of Judas Iscariot, only in Matthew's gospel do we see that he was covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. In Mark and in Luke's gospel, it doesn't mention 30 pieces of silver. It just says money. You see, this all goes back, again, to understanding these differences within the Gospels. Funny, right? Interesting. Maybe not funny, but interesting how only the one that represents the seven years of Jacob's trouble, which is seven years of trumpet judgments, to Matthew is the only one that talks about 30 pieces of silver. And in Zechariah chapter 11, which is the midst of the seven years of trumpets, which is the Matthew trumpet judgments, there's the cutting off of the covenant, and it was done for 30 pieces of silver. All of this has us in Daniel chapter 26, I guess it was, when the about three and a half years and the cutoff happens, where the covenant is broken. What happens when this covenant is broken, and why did it happen? Well, we know that it happens because... And because Satan's been cast down. Okay, we saw in Zechariah that Satan was cast down. And in Daniel chapter 9, when we see here, <clears throat> it goes on to tell us that when this cutoff happens, it's not for himself, and for the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined which means there's going to be a flood that he's going to go after them with which is the little p prince which is the enemy and there's going to be a war that's going to come to an end how long then from this cutoff does this little p prince have to do the flood and go after him with a war. Well, if we've got seven, about three and a half, and then we've got one left down here, that means this is going to last two and a half years. And we know, as we've revealed many times, this is the fifth trumpet. Remember, at the fifth trumpet, the pit is opened. When the pit is open, it's now going to be the time when Antichrist comes back and it's the time of perdition when he becomes the son of perdition. And what is he going to do? Then he's going to go into the temple that had been rebuilt in the first half of trumpets and declare himself to be God. But you see, he didn't build it. There was no Antichrist or Satan on the scene. Only the false prophet was around and still alive, probably in hiding during the first half of trumpets. Antichrist was killed at the end of seals and doesn't come back till mid trumpets once the pit is open. And the pit isn't open till after the city and the streets are rebuilt, the wall and the temple. So now how long is he going to have to bring this destruction with the flood and have a war that will come to an end? It's only two and a half years. Which means the cutoff there isn't about when Messiah is killed. It's about when the war begins. You see, look what happens. In Daniel 12, 7, you know, Daniel's freaking out. How long is this going to be? And he's told it'll be for time, times, and a half. One, two, there's no and. I share this all the time. Time, times, and, and half. So there's no and here, which means it's not one plus two plus a half. It's one, two, plus a half. That's two and a half years. It's going to last two and a half years from the beginning of the fifth trumpet, the first woe, to the end of the sixth trumpet, the second woe. And when he shall have scattered the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Which means at the end of these two and a half years, it's over. That only brings us to 13 years but what's happening during this time 
Well, for those that hadn't seen it, you go to Revelation chapter 12. And we see that when the dragon has lost his battle, which is at the fifth trumpet and he's cast down. He knows he's only got a short time and it's called the time of the first woe. Which is the fifth uh, sorry, which yeah, which is the fifth trumpet, the first woe. And he knows that he has a short time. How long is that short time? Two and a half years. And what does he do? <clears throat> he wants to go after the woman, but she's taken on the wings of an eagle, and she's taken to a place for protection for what? A time and times and half a time. That's one plus two plus a half. This one is three and a half years. So for those that are newer and don't know it, from the middle of the of the uh, 11th year, or about three and a half years into trumpets, Satan is going to be released. The pit is going to be opened when Antichrist comes back and he's going to declare himself God. Messiah is cut off and he's going to go after the woman. And what does he do? Well, in Revelation 12, go after her with a flood. But when he goes after her with a flood, she's taken away for three and a half years until the end of the 14th year. But in Daniel chapter 12, it said that Satan's time is going to last two and a half years, which means until the end of the 13th year. So we saw the flood, and in Revelation 12, we can confirm the flood, and that they're going to be protected, those taken from it, until the end of the 14th year of tribulation. But Satan's time is two and a half of those final three and a half years. And what happens during those two and a half years? Starts with the flood when he goes after her. And then what? Then he goes to make war. So if you go to Revelation 11. And you see when the two witnesses. You see the two witnesses are going to be prophesying and doing their thing, right? The two witnesses, the high priest and king, the, the Messiah and Zerubbabel. And what does it say? Verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. You see? If the beast was there during seals and he's ascending out of the bottomless pit, how did he come back and how did he get to the pit? Because he was killed at the end of the sixth year of seals in the Gog-Magog battle. And then when the pit is opened at the fifth trumpet, the first woe, Antichrist comes back. The beast comes back. He ascends out of the bottomless pit, and look what happens. He'll make war against them and overcome them and kill them. Nobody has realized that this takes two and a half years. This war is two and a half years. It's from the beginning of the, of the fifth trumpet to the end of the sixth trumpet, and it's two and a half years. We know it because of Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. And we know it from the beginning of the first woe, to the end of the second wall. It's so clear. This again. You can then go to Daniel again. Chapter 9. And look at what it says. It says. And unto the end of the war. We covered the flood. We covered to the end of the war. That's going to last two and a half years. As Daniel told us himself. Which means there's a beginning of a war. And there's the end of the war. And we know the beginning of the war is against the two witnesses. And the end of the war is what? When the two witnesses are killed. Huh. When the two witnesses are killed, Revelation 11 tells us that it's at the end of the sixth woe. There's like an hour or so left in it. Showing you that the two witnesses in the war against the two witnesses lasted for two and a half years. And then they're killed at the end of the war. So that means this war with the two witnesses lasted for two and a half years. And at the end of the war, they were killed. Okay. Well, Daniel. In chapter 12. Told us. That when this two and a half years comes to an end. All these things shall be finished. You guys know this one well. In Revelation chapter 10, it says when the seventh trumpet 
where am I? When the seventh trumpet, right here, in verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. So you have the end of the two and a half years that Satan had to reign with the Antichrist and false prophet, the Antichrist having come back from the pit. War breaks out against the two witnesses. And at the end of those two and a half years, we know it's coming to an end. And what happens at the end of the two and a half years? The two witnesses are killed. The two witnesses are killed. And they're dead. They're lying in the streets. They're dead bodies for three days and a half. Okay? So on the fourth day was when what? When they, after three days and a half, so on the fourth day, they stood up. And everybody saw them had great fear. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up uh, to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. Now listen to this. And the same hour. In the same hour. So you've got three and a half days and then the same hour after those three and a half days, there was a great earthquake. A tenth of the city fell. 7,000 uh, of the remnant were, uh, uh, were slain in it. And the remnant were afraid and gave glory to God. The second woe is over. So we get right up to the final hour of the end of the 13th year. This brought us to the end of two and a half years of the war when the two witnesses were killed. Who had to die so that the covenant could be confirmed? Messiah. Messiah, the, the Messiah was one of the two witnesses. Him with Zerubbabel. And he was represented by Matthew's gospel. Because Matthew's gospel of the synoptic gospels is the one where, where, uh, um, where uh, uh, Judas showed the three coins. Uh, uh, sorry, the 30 pieces of silver. Which was directly connected to the 30 pieces prophesied in Zechariah chapter 11, which is during the seven years of trumpets, right where the cutoff would be. Satan's cast down. Antichrist comes back. The temple had been rebuilt by the Lord and with Zerubbabel and those with him. And the Lord is there with the 144,000 during the first half of trumpets before they're given additional powers. And then when Satan is cast down, when the pit is open, Antichrist comes back. He's going into the temple that had been rebuilt by Zerubbabel. Well, the Lord was there as high priest and king with, with working with the 144,000. So it's not the Antichrist. It's not the beast that builds the temple. It's not the beast that made the covenant to get this all going. The, the beast causes the breaking of this covenant because Satan's been cast down and the pit has been opened. Then you see the war that takes place against the two witnesses. And we can see why we have three and a half days, which means on the fourth day. Okay? On the fourth day. Do you know that in the story of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, in the story of... Um, uh, um, what is it, uh, of Jonah, in the story of Jonah, it's something that is hotly debated for centuries. The story with Jonah, okay? And now I forget, off, come on, off the top of my head, where is it? I used to know it like the back of my hand. I'm sure I still do. We know the story, there it is, in Luke 11 with Jonah. The 40 days of the Son of Man. Jesus never fulfilled this yet. He wasn't a warning as Jonah was. And what do we know after the pre-trip? The Lord is coming for the 40 days of the Son of Man. When you go to Mark's gospel, it says 
no sign was given and he got in the ship and left and what happens when the lord is coming at the end of six years of seals and the great multitude is going to come in they don't know when it's coming they don't know when they're going to get to go in the rapture he gives them no sign they see him coming but they don't know when they're going when you go to matthews matthews is the only gospel that says what as jonah was three days and three nights right as jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth where is it so shall the son of man be right only in matthews do we get three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and I don't know why I can't find it. <laughs> I haven't gone to all of them in a, in a little bit. Where is it? I'm going to find it. Okay, maybe I won't. Well, you all know it. In, in Matthew only, do we see. So what happens is people have used that one of the story of Jonah to call it contradictions within the Gospels. But we've revealed that what they mean is prophecy. These have not yet been fulfilled. And so why? Why does Matthew have that Jesus would be in the grave for three days and three nights? If he's in the grave for three days and three nights, what does that mean? It means that he was resurrected on the fourth day. Jesus did not fulfill that yet hence the differences in luke mark and matthew in the story of jonah are prophecy they haven't yet been fulfilled just like people say the 30 pieces of silver and they say as it was in jeremiah but nobody can find it because it's in zechariah it's a future prophecy it is built into the scriptures of the story of the is Revealing the prophetic understanding of the is to come. It, it's, it's so wild to be able to see it, to track it, to follow it, and to understand it. Here it is. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 12. I thought I hit Matthew 12. Maybe because I was just in Luke and didn't realize it. Okay? In Matthew chapter 12... Look at what it says. Matthew 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus never fulfilled this yet. Everybody thinks, wants to debate that he did. But 14 or 15 other places in Scripture tell us that Jesus was risen on the third day. And the count began from when he was taken into the hands of sinful men. We know that he was only in the grave for about a day and a half. Jews try to justify this when, when Christians talk to them to say that any part of one day is the wholeness of another day, of that day. No, this says three full days and three full nights. Not part of one and part of another because it tells you three days and three nights which means his resurrection will be from the grave on the fourth day. It doesn't even include when he was taken into the hands of sinful men. It doesn't include when he was being crucified. It's saying just the grave portion will be three days and three nights, which means his resurrection is on the fourth day. Lo and behold, the only place you see that in all of prophecy is the two witnesses for which we were shown Jesus is one of the witnesses. He is Messiah Joseph, Messiah ben Joseph. And who are the Jews looking to? They're knowing that their Messiah ben Joseph is going to die in battle. Brothers and sisters, it is Messiah Jesus. And it's a terrible thing to think that Messiah Jesus is going to have to do this again. But scripture tells us everywhere. 
Scripture lays it out for us. And we've revealed, as I bring this to an end, we know why he's going to do it. He's doing it as the bull sacrifice for the priestly line, which is something connected to the 144 during the time of trumpets. But it's all because of Moses responsible for the first strike and uh, Aaron responsible for the sh second strike of the rock, who is Jesus, when they did it in the wilderness. One for the people, one for the priests. And this is the one that hasn't yet happened, like Leviticus chapter 1, whereas the one as the lamb without blemish, Jesus fulfilled as Moses' sacrifice that he fulfilled the first time. What the Jews are looking for is the high priest who is greater than Aaron, who is the sacrifice as the Messiah ben Joseph that they know will die in battle. This is that sacrificial battle of the ox. It's exactly what it is, and it's the only one, which is why only in Matthew is it after three days and three nights, which means after three days is on the fourth day. We know he's one of the two witnesses. Now, let me bring it to an end with to you guys, remembering this whole chapter's two years, okay? There's Hebrews 13. There's John chapter 20. It's a prophetic picture of the very end of the sixth year of trumpets. What do we see happens at the end of the sixth year of trumpets? Right at the very end of it, the two witnesses are killed. Three and a half days, right? After three days and after three nights is on the fourth day. And then what happens? Then a voice is heard from heaven and they rise up. Okay? Then they rise up. And what do we know? That the seventh angel sounds immediately after the tribulation of the sixth trumpet. Immediately, the scriptures tell us. Look at this. In Matthew chapter 24, we read, At the coming of the Son of Man, this is when he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, at the end of that sixth trumpet. It says immediately after the tribulation of those days. See, which is what? At the sound of the great trumpet, which is the seventh trumpet. When they're going to see him coming on the clouds. So, it's three days and three nights, so on the fourth day, then they're, they resurrect. He's now fulfilled the Jonah prophecy of Matthew. He resurrects, and in the same hour, there's a great earthquake. Uh, 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 7,000 men fall in it. The rest <coughs> give glory to God in heaven. And immediately after that happens, which is only an hour after the resurrection, it says immediately after. And what did it say? As soon as the seventh trumpet sounds, the mystery of God should be over in Revelation 10. Why? Because they'll see him immediately after the sixth trumpet. The seventh trumpet will begin to sound and the mystery of God shall be finished. Crazy wild, right? Well, watch this. Do you know in relation to chapters to years, let's have a look at what Hebrews 13 says. Watch this. Now remember, Hebrews 13 is what? In the chapters to years, prophetically we're reading as this right above this line. Meaning what? This time where he's just resurrected. Remember, he was killed three days and three nights. On the fourth day he resurrected. And within the same hour, he resurrects <clears throat> and within the same hour, these events happen. So it's right at the end of the 13th year. Right as the seventh trumpet on this line is about to sound. Which is the same time frame as John chapter 20. Right at the end on this line time frame. Okay? Watch this. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20. What's the picture? The end. What is it? It's the end. 
When he's what? When he died again and what? Rose again from the dead. Okay? When he rises again from the dead. Let's see what it says. Verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead. Again. Again. From the dead. Our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Hello. Again from the dead. Through the blood of the now everlasting covenant. Guys, you have to remember the, the covenant that he has already done for us. When the time of the Gentiles is over, it's done. And then what is he doing? He's making another covenant. And this everlasting covenant is for what? It was for the priestly line. But what happens? When he makes this covenant, it's an everlasting covenant that will last how long? Through the millennial reign. Which is for what? For the Jews. Their promised millennial reign. Craziness. And it, it, it last it ended where? <clears throat> right here. All of these things landing in chapters to years. Proving this isn't just something made up. We've been proving this for years. Well, you know where else it shows up? Watch this. In the discord uh, in the gospel of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, do you know that this wording is only found once in Matthew? Yep, you guessed it. What does this represent? The after six days is the after six years of trumpets. So where is it talking about? Right here. See? There's six years. Soon as it comes to an end, like right on this line, just like here and just like here. And what does it say? In Matthew 17, it says in verse 9, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Not just risen from the dead, not just risen again. Risen again from the dead. In all of the in all of the synoptic gospels, it's only found right here in Matthews. Do you know where we find it when we get to John? Well, if it's going to line up with Hebrews 13, if it's going to line up with the gospel uh, uh, in, in Matthew in relation to the after six days as after six years, then what do you think the chances are we're going to find it in John chapter 20? Well, you guessed it, especially if you've been, if you've been around for a while. That's exactly what you're going to find out, right? And what does it say in John chapter 20, verse 9? For as yet they knew not. The scripture, hello, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Why? It's the same reason Matthew, Mark, and Luke have the resurrection story in the last chapter of their books, yet John has his in chapter 20 instead of 21. Why? Because it's the exact same same prophetic picture in the chapters two years as we have been teaching the whole way through because the testator must shed blood or the testator the testament the covenant of that testator is of no strength until that blood is shed and that shedding of blood is for, you guessed it, the priestly line and for the portion of the time of Judah. Once this happens, what's left? The final year. The final year. What do we know happens? 
Well, now we know that as soon as this starts, he, as soon as that seventh trumpet blasts, he immediately, it says, when those six are done right on this line on the bottom part, he immediately is going to be seen coming on the clouds like Matthew 24. And when he comes on the clouds of Matthew 24, you go to Zechariah chapter 14, which is the 14th year beginning, and it talks about a battle he is now going to fight against them. What? And here he is, feet down on the Mount of Olives when he returns as lightning from one end of heaven unto the other, when the whole world will now see him feet down on the Mount of Olives to begin what? The 14th year. The 14th year he now returns as the world has understood post-trib returning feet down on the Mount of Olives like Zechariah 14. And what is he doing? He's going to fulfill the final 14th year just as we read in Zechariah 14. This final year is the Jeremiah 25, which is the day of the Lord, which is the day of the Lord, and that day of the Lord is the year of his vengeance, like Jeremiah 25. And in that is Matthew chapter 24. It is the year that when the Lord returns on the clouds, when everyone will see him, at the last trumpet, when it begins to sound, that it will be as it started, the day and hour no one knows, and it will be the final year as Noah, which is the final 14th year judgment of the Lord, which is the day of the Lord, the year of his wrath. So, when you go back to Daniel, and we followed all of this stuff, tracking through the whole storyline in Daniel chapter 9, and we saw that these are the seven years of seals and then about three and a half years of trumpets for which the Lord was here during the seventh year of seals. And he's here during the about three and a half years of trumpets while the city street and wall are being built by Zerubbabel and the house of Israel and Judah now there after it's been cleansed. He makes this covenant. The city and the streets and the temple get rebuilt during the first about three and a half years, then Messiah is cut off. He's cut off because now Antichrist, who was killed at the end of six <coughs> of seals, Satan is now cast down. The pit is open. Antichrist comes back. He goes after to destroy all of them, goes after them with a flood, which is mid-trumpets. And then war breaks out against the two witnesses, for which we know it will last two and a half years, the end of this war is when the two witnesses are killed, right? You know, three and a half days plus one hour is the end of the sixth year of trumpets or the end of the 13th year of tribulation. When this war is done, bam, the two witnesses are resurrected after the three and a half days. They're resurrected. When they're resurrected, soon as the immediately after at the sounding of the trumpet the lord will return like an hour or so later feet down on the mount of olives and when he comes he's coming to fulfill what the final 14th year so if you had seven years about three and a half years and then two and a half years with the flood and going after him with the war that means 13 years have come to an end right here, leaving one year, one week as one year in the prophetic understanding of the end, which means Jesus who made a covenant and broke it at mid trumpets because Satan and the beast and everybody came back is now confirming the covenant that he made with many. He is now confirming in that final year crazy right and he look at what it says and in the midst of the week 
he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease because he's destroyed the enemies. He's going to put an end to the overspreading of abominations. If this was about the beast, how is the beast going to put an end to the abominations? The beast is the abomination. Satan is the abomination. It is the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives that is putting an end to all of the abominations. And he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined, listen to this, shall be poured upon the desolate. Why poured upon? Because in that final seventh year of trumpets, in that final 14th year of judgment, the bulls of wrath are being poured out. Brothers and sisters, the one who confirms the covenant for one week is in the end of days, the Messiah returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, now King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And when he does, this is the final battle, just as Zechariah chapter 14, it is the Revelation chapter 19, when the Lord comes and makes war with his crowns and his vestiture dipped in blood, he is going to what? With his sharp short sword shall smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. This is the Jeremiah. And let me finish with this final note to give you guys strengthening encouragement to see why on top of all other things, I believe this is the year. Because it says in Jeremiah 25, 12, when the 70 years are accomplished, when those 70 years are accomplished, it's the cup of the Lord's wrath that he will get all nations to drink when he brings his sword, which is the sword of what? The wrath of the winepress of Almighty God. To what? Tread the grapes. When does this happen? Prophetically, it's at the comp at the when the 70 years come to pass. Do you know that in this incredible timeline that we have from the count of Christ in relation to the Jubilees with the Shemitah years, that equals a perfect seven year Shemitah cycle? from the beginning of the King James to the end of the King James completion, which is perfectly counted from the Revelation 12 sign in 2017 that began a new seven-year cycle, which is a perfect count from when Israel in 1967 captured the rest of Jerusalem, the 70 years end, in the fall, see right here, they end at the Feast of Trumpets 2037, which leaves exactly one Shemitah year, which is what? When the 70 years are accomplished, it is the wrath of the Lord God Almighty. Jeremiah 25, Zechariah chapter 14 Revelation chapter 19 with the sword of the Lord God Almighty in the final year of the grapes wrath war and when it's over guess what it's the final jubilee do you know there's no other year do you know we can't move and say well 2067 really wasn't 20 uh, 1967 really wasn't 1967 there is no other prominent 70 year coming to an end in anything else related to Israel. And the count from when Christ declared the Jubilee in Luke chapter 4, in counting the Shemitah Sabbaths from it, it just so happens that the end of the 14 years, beginning at Feast of Trumpets 2024, when the 14 years are over, it's the final jubilee, just like 
it showed on this chart 777 seven, seven, and the final jubilee. Brothers and sisters, I hope you're excited. I know some of this is 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 very it's harsh. It's harsh. I think that's a great word for it. It's harsh. It's hard to to fathom. But the scriptures have revealed it. And when you understand that the Jews themselves in their prophetic revelations, in their understandings from thousands of years passed down, the revelations that we have revealed here over this last six and a half years are a confirmation in order of what they have understood is coming. And now do you see and understand why they were blinded for our sakes? They were blinded for our sakes till the fullness of the Gentiles before he makes a covenant with them again when who comes in? When Abraham's people come in and he makes that covenant. They're looking for a place where the foundation was laid whose builder is the Lord himself. Not the Antichrist. Not the beast. Which means during seals, when the Antichrist shows up, it's not about the rebuilding of the temple. It's about the mark of the beast being placed on or in, although it says on, the temple of the flesh, which is because during seals in the time of the Gentiles, the temple of God will still dwell in men. The Antichrist will be going for the mark of the beast during the time of seals, not a physical rebuilt temple. That comes during trumpets when the Lord is over there overseeing it, while Zerubbabel is there involved in rebuilding it, and when Antichrist is, res is coming back, when he comes back, when the pit is opened, that is mid-trumpets when he will then at that point go into the physical temple rebuilt and declare himself God, but not the one having rebuilt it. Brothers and sisters, as you can see, it is the Lord Jesus Christ Messiah himself in these prophetic messiah forms just as the jews have understand revealed in the prophetic order of the end of days over the truth of 14 years and 50 days that come first the one who confirms the covenant with many is the lord jesus christ when he returns feet down on the mount of olives it is his covenant he is now confirming Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. I pray all of this from the beginning has blessed you and strengthened you and helped you to understand that I believe we are absolutely in the year and that the revelation of the end of days is confirming it more and more every single passing week. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. Talk to you soon. Bye for now.